Hello and good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, as it is in England here, or good evening if you're in Australia, because I know it's going to be evening for you there. I want to welcome all of you to today's mentorship course, uh, a five-day course with the master, Tom Williams, the inventor of volume spread analysis. I'm very excited to have put this course together. We're going to go through a lot of the basics. We're going to go through some intermediate and some advanced stuff, culminating in an advanced trading session on Friday where we're going to show the uh, new volume thermometer. We're going to trade our live accounts. I had a lovely trade last week. I shorted the British pound on an upthrust in the downtrend and uh, took 160 ticks out the market in 24 hours. If you were in last week's seminar, you saw that set up. It is on YouTube. Go and have a look at it. It shows you that you know that these markets truly do move on supply and demand and no supply and no demand. Also, I forecasted last week that gold would come down to 1700 and we're trading around 1720 at the moment. We'll talk about why we saw the end of a rising market today. So we're delighted to be with all of you. Thank you, all of you, for your support of Trade Guider. And uh, this is um, a mentorship course that Tom and I have put together that goes through all the principles. So there's a lot of stuff here that you may have heard before, but there'll be some new stuff that maybe you haven't heard before as well. And as always, Tom and I will trade live on Friday with all of you as a group. And I do encourage you, we're going to be trading the futures markets and the currencies, the Forex markets. If you haven't already done so, you can download the same platform that we're going to use to trade, which is the Infinity AT platform. You can get that absolutely free with data for 30 days. And if you're interested in doing that at the end, I'll let you know where you can get that platform. OK, so let me introduce myself for those of you who don't know me, but I think you all do. Uh, my name is Gavin Holmes. Uh, I'm a professional trader. I'm an author of two books and a, a third book being published in uh, December. And I'm also the chief executive of Trade Guider Systems International. And with me is the man that taught me pretty much everything I know about trading and investing. His name is Tom George Williams, and he's a retired syndicate trader and indeed the inventor of volume spread analysis, which is what we're going to focus on this week. So the way the class runs, uh, we run for an hour and 30 minutes each day. Uh, we may well overrun some days, just so you know. We, we, you know. we want you to learn, so we may well find that we'll overrun a little bit. But definitely, you'll be with us for an hour and 30 minutes each session. We'll take a 15-minute break between sessions so that you can go and get a cup of tea, a cup and coffee, uh, whatever your poison is. But please, don't drink any alcohol because <laughs> we've got lots to teach you. And um, we do encourage audience participation. So remember, there's no such thing as a silly question when it comes to trading and investing your own money. So we encourage you to ask us questions. And remember, if you have a headset and microphone, the way we've structured this mentorship course is you can indeed, by typing in question MIC, <clears throat> so question mic, it means I'm going to open the microphone and you can talk to Tom and I directly if you don't like to do that because there is a, a lot of you here then you can just type the question in and uh, as I said here and I mean this there is no such thing as a silly question please ask it okay please ask the question it, it, it's very very important that you do ask if you don't ask the question you're not going to get uh, the answer Ken I don't know if you can see me see there but Sam's in the room Sam Abbey He's from uh, Singapore. Great guy. Can you help him? He says he can't hear, but I know for a fact we've got sound because um, everyone else isn't typing in no sound. So maybe his his speakers aren't working or something, but maybe you can help him, Ken. Um, I also recommend that you take notes throughout the session because there's a lot of information that will be on the recording. OK, but we do suggest that you take some notes. So the sessions are really the next two days. We're going to focus on the VSA principles, and we're going to have Tom explain each principle in detail. So pay close attention to how Tom describes the principle. Today, we're going to talk about accumulation and distribution. And then on Wednesday, Dr. Gary Dayton will come in and talk about springs and upthrusts, which are very, very powerful. At the moment, I'm making a lot of money trading springs. OK, and we'll talk a little bit about what a spring is when we look at it in volume spread analysis terms. We'll talk about trigger numbers. We're going to talk about a lot of things, actually. And, and let me talk about the uh, objectives in a minute about what we want to teach you. But 
Can you identify when a market is topping out and bottoming out? Absolutely, you can. Indeed, in gold, I was so confident that gold would fall a couple of weeks ago, I saw a signal, my favorite, called the end of a rising market. And sure enough, gold has collapsed and uh, had its biggest fall that we've seen for many, many years. Uh, sorry, many, many months, rather, um, back there in the uh, beginning of October. So we'll look at that. And then on Friday, we're going to trade the live markets. Tom and I are going to focus on all the currency pairs. We're going to look at some stocks. We're going to trade mainly the futures market, the NASDAQ, the S&P, and the Dow. And we'll trade gold and silver, crude oil. Whenever we see an opportunity to make money, we're going to go and find it for you and show you how we do it. So the sessions start each day at 6 a.m. Chicago time. Uh, we will definitely overrun. I'm sure of that. So um, although it's a three hour session each day, we will take a break. You will get a break in between because there's a lot of information to give you. So those are the uh, the session times. And um, what are the objectives? Well, there's many. This is this this list here has been put together by previous customers who have emailed us and told us what they've learned in these sessions. So hopefully this week you'll pick some of this up as well. Now, some of you here have been to more than one of our mentorship courses. And some of you, this is your first time. This is the first mentorship course you've ever done. There will be some repetition because there has to be. Um, we always know that there'll be, uh, we have, the principles don't change. They haven't changed for 100 years. They're not going to change today. But what you will learn this week is some new information about the trending system that Tom has developed, which we're using in our hedge fund software. And again, because the markets at the moment are so volatile, there'll be some wonderful opportunities on certainly Friday for us to go and make some money in the market. So what do we want to teach you? Well, certainly better timing. Timing the trade is everything. How to cut losing trades quickly and know why you're cutting them. Tom had to do it the other day. Even the master has to cut trades. He doesn't always get it right, although he gets it right about 99% of the time. Sometimes, and he was right. Interestingly enough, last week in the live trading session, he was short. And then there was an upthrust. He closed his position and then the market came off. I actually shorted that upthrust and made quite a lot of money. So, you know, we always got to try, time our trades. Learn to trade well for the sake of trading well, said one customer. How to prepare mentally for trading. How to take fewer trades but better trades. That's something I've had to learn the hard way. How to deal with the delay on the daily data to set up for the next day. How to place stops correctly. Where is the highest probability entry? So in, in VSA, we have about 10 very high probability entries. One of them appeared in gold a few weeks ago on the daily chart. It's a high probability. It doesn't mean it's 100% guaranteed. It's just a game of probability. That's what trading is, everyone. It's a probability game. But you can, by reading the chart, put the odds in your favor. Confidence is everything, and we hope at the end of this week you'll have a lot more confidence to read the market correctly. How to identify accumulation and distribution. We're going to talk about this principle this morning. It's very important. Professionals accumulate something when the news is bad, and they distribute it when the news is good. We're going to learn where you exit a trade. When is it time to close it out? And one of the questions we get asked a lot, what is absorption volume? OK, because everyone who studies VSA tends to pigeonhole themselves into the thought process of ultra high volume is always weakness, especially if it's on an up bar, which is, of course, we know most often that is a true statement. But there are times, especially in a bull market, as we're seeing now, where professionals or smart money, as I call them, are prepared to absorb any sellers to the left and prepared to mark the market up further. And we're seeing some examples of that. How to identify when a stock is ready to short or go long. That's not a difficult thing to do. We know that professionals accumulate on down moves when news is bad. To reinforce knowledge, existing knowledge, that you may have gained through reading Tom's books or my books. So this is very much a session about reinforcing the principles. How to manage a trade. And how to assess risk that we will do on Friday. How to create a trading plan. I'll share with you a trading plan. Uh, Ron says, uh, I'm struck. OK, my objective is to have an understanding that will allow me to trade at the end of this week. I, Ron, there's no reason you shouldn't. 
None whatsoever. None whatsoever. If you pay attention, if you stay focused, if you take notes, then you'll learn something that you will be able to trade by Friday afternoon. That I will promise you. Now, you I, again, don't rush in. I always remember to tell people, practice, practice, practice. Because the big P is the way we learn anything in life. If I want to go and play golf or anything, I have to practice. I'm afraid there's no shortcuts. And the market is the biggest way of making money in the world and the biggest way of losing money. So practice is absolutely vital. And on Friday, we'll be in the live market as a group, all of us, okay, all together. And we will go and look for trades. So how to read the background correctly. How to build a small account using risk management. How to learn just one high probability setup. This is one customer a few months ago came in and said, Gavin, I don't want to learn them all. I just want to learn one principle that can make me money. Well, as it happens, Rita Offen, who was taught by Tom, I'm going to call her Mrs. Upthrust, because that is her trade setup that makes her a lot of money. And it's an upthrust. I mean, it's a very powerful signal to short the market. And you're going to learn all about them on Wednesday. How you maximize profitable situations. You know, it's very easy to trade. You think, I mean, I mean, when I say it's easy, you can push a button and be in the market. A monkey can press a button and be in a market. It doesn't take much intelligence. But as you'll, le you'll see and you'll learn this week, knowing why you're pressing that button, knowing why your timing is, is, is important, knowing what the background is, which I talk about here, how to read the background correctly. The chart is a language. And you're going to learn a new language this week. We're going to teach you how to be a better disciplined trader. Now, how do we teach that? It's very difficult. I mean, I've met a lot of you in this room. Some of you from Sydney. Some of you I met in Singapore. Some of you in uh, Hong Kong. Some of you in uh, Malaysia. And it's always a difficult thing to teach someone discipline. I am not particularly disciplined at times. But I'm a good trader. That's because I'm very, very quick, as Tom will tell you to get out of losing positions, and I let winning positions run. And do I still get aggressive? And do I have days when I make mistakes? Sure. Everyone does. Every good trader that I've met has a bad day in the market. I'm afraid that's just life, and you better get used to it. You're not always going to have winning trades. You've got to accept that. It's part of being a trader, and the ability to cope with losses and deal with losses is very, very important. Again, it's also important to maximize profitable trades, get the most out of them. And that's what we're going to show you to do with Tom's trending system. And then how do you identify a sequence? Volume spread analysis, as you'll see, starts with ultra high volume very often, not always, but very often. And then a sequence occurs, which allows you to get in and take a trade. Um, here's some other things that people have told us they wanted to learn. To learn all the VSA principles and then put them into context, including background and trade setups. Today, you're going to learn trade setups. You're going to learn all the principles of weakness today, and we're going to cover that in sessions. And tomorrow, we're going to cover signs of strength. We're going to look at where the highest probability entries are. And in fact, you know, I traded one live last week, the upthrust in a downtrend, very high probability. You're going to learn why professionals distribute and accumulate and know when they're doing it. And the trouble is the news will wrong foot you. Your own brain will be telling you to do the opposite of what you should do, which is why so many traders lose money. To learn how to identify at the top and the bottom of a market. To understand herd behavior. I'm afraid that's the truth about human beings. We do act in a herd often, and that's what causes us to lose money. We'll understand and teach you what a weak holder is and make sure that you are not either of these groups. I don't want you to leave Friday and be a herd trader or a weak holder. We'll learn the shakeout. It's a very important signal, and it's exactly what happened last year in August as the news came out about the U.S. Uh, downgrade. We'll talk about the upthrust, and we'll do that on Wednesday. And we'll talk a bit about it today because we're going to talk about signs of weakness. And the upthrust is, a, is so obvious when you see it. If you just traded upthrusts in weak markets, then you, you do very well. But you do get upthrusts in strong markets, and they're not 
the place to take short trades, as we'll explain. So we'll talk about the significance of the range or the spread of the price bar, okay, because that's important. Everything is in context, and it's in context with the background of the chart. We'll learn why multiple time frames are important, and they are very important. We don't just want to look at one time frame. We want to look at more than one time frame. That's extremely important. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just doing a quick sound check again. There, there's, there you are. I'm still here. Yeah, so we're going to look at the background of the chart and why the background is very important, okay? And multiple time frames. You know, the market is moving every second that it's open. So do you trade a one-minute chart or an hourly chart? Difficult question to answer for some of you. I will share with you my trading plan and share with you what time frames I've particularly found useful and we'll show you in a live market how we scan for actual trade setups. And then we're going to talk about the test. Now, the test does seem to confuse a lot of you. And uh, the test is a very important signal, especially in a bull market, which we're currently in. And we'll talk about that as well. So let's talk about what qualities make a good trader and investor now i have met thousands of traders and investors from around the world in my 10 years of doing this i'm very blessed to be able to uh, travel the world and teach and meet a lot of great people i've also met the smart money i'm going to be working with a smart money trader in our hedge fund here in england his name's mike he's the fourth biggest gold trader in the world and these people exist and and, and it's nothing for them to trade 5,000 contracts in a market at any one time. And I've seen this happen. I've seen this being done. So do not think for one minute the smart money don't exist. They absolutely do exist. And they're very nice people. Let me just be clear. But they're also predatory. They don't care. They're, you know, they're, They've got no friends in the market because they are there to make money, just like you would be. You are there to make money for yourself. So are these professionals. And they all have these qualities. Patience. It's a big one. They're very patient people. They know the market will give them a great trade setup at some point. If it doesn't happen while they're looking at the charts, they wait. They don't rush in. As Tom taught me, you don't get on the wrong bus. You get on the right bus. If your number five is what you're waiting for and a number three arrives, don't get on it. Most retail traders jump on the wrong bus and end up in the wrong destination, which is losing money. Timing. They're all good at timing the market, and timing is everything. Confidence. Confidence is a very important part of trading. Confidence is a very important part of anything you do in life. If you have the belief system in your ability to make money in the market, you will make money in the market. But a lot of people don't know how to deal with losing positions, and they don't then have confidence or they lose confidence. This seminar will build your confidence. That I know. Study. You've got to study the charts. The charts are a language. And they we will teach you the language. Then you've got to put the work in. There is no shortcuts here. You've got to do the work. Self-discipline. Don't rush into trades that are not there. It took me probably a year of Tom sitting next to me, smacking me around the back of the head when I took a bad trade, to know that I was getting on the wrong bus. Don't get on the wrong bus. Become a master of volume spread analysis. What we're teaching you is the truth. Someone said they want to do what experts do in BSA, like Philip Friston, like Tom Williams, like myself. We're going to teach you what we do this week and what we look for. A desire. A will to win. I mean, a lot of people that have met me said to me, Gavin, you seem to have so much energy and you seem so passionate about what you do. That's because I have a will to win and a desire not just to help myself, but to help others too. That's a passion that burns within me and you can have it too. If you want to win in the market, you need that desire though. You need to be hungry. You need to focus. 
You need to be focused at all times. You can't take your eye off the market. As Tom said, it's always like this. We see a setup. We think it's coming. We think it's coming. Tom says, Gav, go and make me a cup of tea, will you? As I go and make him a cup of tea, the market collapses and we didn't take the trade. So you've got to be focused. You can't take your eye off the game. And you've got to understand the game and be open-minded to what we teach you. What we teach you is the truth about the markets. You need to have belief. Believe in your human ability to make money because you've been given it. You have the ability. You've already taken a big step in your belief system by spending money to be with us today. You've given your time to be with us today, which is extremely valuable. So you are doing the right thing. You're becoming educated. You must have a trading plan, and we'll share a trading plan with you this week. You must have, and I say must, you must have good risk management. And we'll talk on Friday about how to mitigate risk, how to know when to trade certain uh, account sizes and what you can and can't trade. As Tom taught me, you must concentrate. You must focus. It's so important. This, when you press that button and you're in the market, you're trading against some of the most intelligent beings on this planet. And don't think that isn't a true statement. I know I've met them and they're very clever. The reason I wrote a book called Trading in the Shadow of the Smart Money is because these traders are very smart and they've also got a lot of money. In fact, in America, in Australia, I think it's Greg Kofi, who just retired from a hedge fund, is said to have made somewhere in the region of $600 million as a hedge fund manager. And he didn't do that through not concentrating and not being focused. Be independent in thought. You have been given the gift of thought and the power of your brain. It's why you're here. Use it. Use it carefully and wisely and you'll make money. Always be contrarian. Don't believe everything you see on the TV and the radio and the, uh, the newspapers because it's probably not there for your benefit. Learn to cope with fearful thoughts. When you have a fearful thought, understand that it's simply feedback from the universe. It's feedback to help you, not to make you panic. So learn to cope with it and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Tom often talks about trading as being like a soldier in the army. And you go into the market, and if you're trading certainly these very small time frames, it's like being in the trenches of World War I. You're, waiting, you're popping your head up thinking, am I going to get shot today? We're going to teach you to know when to move out your trench and go into the market. Follow the system that you develop for yourself. We're going to give you a lot of information this week but it's important that you adapt what we are going to show you to your personality style. I've met some of you in this room, and you're all different. That's the wonderful thing about becoming a human being. We're all different. But there are a lot of things we're going to teach you that will apply to every single trader, whether you're aggressive, conservative, whether you're experienced or inexperienced. And please... If it doesn't go right, if you're in a position and it's going against you, just close it. There's no reason to be in the trade. OK, so let's get to the meat on the bones. What is volume spread analysis? What is the main concept behind it? And why is it all related to accumulation and distribution from the smart money? OK, so I'm going to bring in Tom now to talk to you about the concept of volume spread analysis. And we're going to talk about this trader here, Richard Demille Wyckoff. So let me pose you all a question. Has everyone here, yes or no, heard of the trader Richard Demille Wyckoff? Yes or no? I'll just get a few. I I'd be surprised if anyone said no, but if you haven't, don't worry. But this man is the man that we honor, even though he's passed away, for the work that we're about to show you. So everyone has heard of Wyckoff, who was a fact in trader in the early 1900s. And the method that we're teaching you is all about establishing why a market's going to move. So the cause, everything, the universe we live in works on a law, works on many laws. But one of them is called cause and effect, effort versus result, supply and demand. 
These are things that we hear about, but most people don't understand them. And we're going to talk today about what causes that price to move. It's not an accident. There are no accidents in the stock market. In fact, in any market, things are moved by the smart money. Now, the cause is simply the imbalance of the supply and demand situation as the market unfolds. And that results in strength or weakness appearing in the market that you're trading. But for the correct analysis of the volume, you need to understand that the recorded volume contains only half the knowledge required for a correct analysis. The other half of the knowledge is found when observing the spread or the range of the price bar. And then what did the closing price do on that bar? Volume indicates the amount of activity. That's the key to it. Volume indicates the amount of activity on the price bar. And the spread or the range of the bar shows what the price actually did. But most importantly, where the price closed. So here is VSA 101. Volume, range of bar, closing price. But here's the key. We don't just look at one bar in isolation. We compare the bar to the background. And then as each bar follows it, we look at each bar to tell us a story. And that story determines the behavior of what the market's about to do. Markets change behavior just like human beings change behavior. You can wake up one morning, get out of bed, as I usually do, and you'll be in a great mood and you'll be happy and you'll be overjoyed. I try to do that every day. I make a point of doing that. But there have been days when I've got out of bed and felt sorry for myself, felt a bit down, a bit negative. I don't do that very often, I must add, anymore. I've changed my whole thought process. But it did happen to me in the past. Some people out there get depressed. Others are very happy. Why? Well, they change their behaviors. And it depends. Every day is a new day. Well, the market changes its behavior every moment, second by second, moment by moment. As Wyckoff taught us, the market changes its behavior, and it's all in the volume, which is the activity of the smart money. So let's introduce you all to Tom, who's going to be doing this course. You can hear a lot from Tom these next five days. And he says here, if you can read a chart correctly, you will understand the markets do not move randomly, but are moved by the smart money. And you can see their intention at support and resistance levels by looking for the telltale footprints hidden in the volume and price. And you can then have a chance to profit by following in their footsteps. Volume is vital in your analysis, which is why, ironically, the self-regulated exchanges around the world will not release true volume figures until the day after day trading took place. So please give a warm welcome to the master, Tom Williams. Tom, the basic concept of volume spread analysis. Can you explain why volume spread analysis is so important to a trader? Right. Thank you, Gav. Yeah, I, Tom Williams here. Lovely to talk to you. Um, right. Well, that's a huge question to answer straight off. <laughs> Start with a difficult one. Start with a difficult one, Gavin says. Um, anyway, uh, volume is absolutely vital to us of course because that's the amount of activity that's going on at that moment now i've been watching the 15 minute chart this morning um right could you put a 15 minute up for them to see yep. because there's well there's two principles here which are pretty obvious especially in hindsight but don't get alarmed if you get it wrong, right? It's not that the the market's lying to you. It's not that you've uh, the principle isn't true. It's just this morning, Gav. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Yeah, just here. But remember, the mind is a very complex bit of equipment you have, and uh, it's odd how it works at times. I mean, I speak to Peter often, you know, he's a computer expert, comes up and helps me. And uh, be quiet, he's a bit overweight. 
okay, you could, well, I could, I could lose some weight. So you would think logically that as a human being, you think, right, okay, look, you're overweight, right, or you smoke, or you do this, or you do that, right, for your own good, for your own good, that is, stop it. But you don't, you can't. Now, what I said to Peter, of course, in a jokingly way, I said, trouble is, Peter, is don't forget that you've got two parts of your brain. You've got the cerebral cortex at the top, which everybody knows immediately. They show pictures of it, the gray matter, right? But what they don't tell you is that you also have a primitive brain at the base of your skull. I used to know the name of it, but I've forgotten now. But it's that part. The amygdala. Is it the amygdala? Yeah. Right, Gavin, tell me. He knows more than I do about it. Anyway, it's that part of your brain that allows you to go to sleep and you can uh, breathe. You perspire. You do this. Your kidneys work. Everything is working nicely while you're sleeping. Okay? So this is the primitive brain. But the trouble is, when you get, say, hungry, we're talking about dieting, the primitive brain realize it that you're hungry so it starts saying let's eat i want some food <laughs> right and it looks up at the cortex which is above and says, now stop all that nonsense about dieting and this and that and all the other things let's eat and you've got to be so well well i don't know it's very very difficult as you probably know to overcome those impulses from that primitive brain so keep that in mind, you know, if you have any failures in trading, it's not that the principles are wrong or anything. It's probably that you've just got it wrong. Because I always say the human being is the weak link here. But look, have you got the 50-minute chart up? I have, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, now look, put the cursor on this lower bar here. Here. Yeah. Right, those two bars. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah. Okay, now, the market, without question, moves on supply and demand. And you see these principles all the time. Well, very frequently. Okay. And what happens is that the professional, the, the smart money, Gavin calls it, are traders that think nothing of throwing four or 5,000 contracts into the arena with the anticipation of higher prices. Right, and they may join other professionals, and there's groups of them. Well, it's no good asking too many questions, but we know that when we see a surge of volume, like we see at the bottom here, look, on those two bars, and admittedly the second volume appears to be on a blue bar, which is up bar, but remember, you've got this bottom tail attached to it, and that's where the, probably the buying came in. Got that, Gav? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, now, if that area of supply that we see there is tested of some time, then the market's going to go up, right? So if you believe that, you have to concentrate because then, okay, it goes up one bar. We have a black bar, level no, my, bar. My, my bars are a different color, so don't worry about the colors. Don't okay, about don't worry about the colors, right. Now, lo and behold... This is what we're looking for. We have a, a down bar, look. Is that it, Gav? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm following. But look at that low volume. Look. Relative to this high volume over here. Now, that means that there was definitely buying on that, those initial down bars. And now the market's fallen back down into that level or that area and the volume is low, that tells us that there is no selling pressure on the downside in the market, right? That means that the so-called smart money, there'd be somebody selling, but not the smart money, look, because that's indicating the very, very low volume. That means the balance of supply and demand is telling you that demand must be greater than the supply. And that's why the volume is low. Now, you see this all the time. It doesn't come in exactly the same sequence as this. 
Sometimes there's a few more bars. Sometimes it, it tests a bit lower. But then your, your ability to read these charts, as Gavin says, it's a language. When you read a chart, you're, it's like Braille. You're looking at a language. But whenever you see that, you know you're going to get higher prices. And there's a question from, um, from Gling. Yeah. He says, after you see that, the very next bar goes up at this very low volume. It looks a bit like low demand, but the next bar recovers, which means, obviously, there can't be no demand there because the next bar would close lower. So do you just want to explain, would you be concerned if you were going long about the low volume on the other no. bar? You're not concerned about the low volume on the next bar because what they say to that is the reason why it's gone up on low volume after two serious signs of spread, right? Two very, very serious. You've got to believe the, the principle that there is no supply. And the reason they say the next bar can go up on low volume is there's a shortage of stocks at that level. There's a shortage of, of supply. So they have to crawl up, mark it up, right? But your your main influence is these two bars behind you that have strength. Now, if you had weakness behind you and you saw no demand, that's a different story altogether. But we're talking about the principle of going long. Now, if you nailed that into your brain somehow and waited until that sequence appeared, which it does very, very often, uh, you would be very, a very, very poor trader if you couldn't make any money. Very poor. Okay, so on that principle... The market went up, look, one bar, two, it went up three bars. But then, bang, there's some supply or no demands appeared at the top here. Look, supply, we have a, supply coming in, number 26. We have a signal. Now, the computer can read. Uh, it reads what you told it to read, just like I'm telling you. Now, unfortunately, there are no signals on that particular time frame on the low there. But I'm sure there will be signals on different time frames. But on this one, look, there's a sign of weakness came in after an up move. But note that the up move isn't all that dramatic. On the seven-minute chart, just so you know, we did have some signs of strength there. On the right, okay. Frame. So, okay, so on that weakness there, which the computer's telling you, if you press F1, okay, right, the market drifts off, look. And you've even got a no demand bar there, look, Gav. Yeah. And that's why it's drifting off at the moment. So there's nothing at the moment that I would rush in and want to trade that. Although it's a down bar now on a little bit of increased volume, definitely. But you have to wait for confirmation. You have to wait till you clearly see your bus with your number on it. And then you go in. But, I mean, when I first started, I didn't know what, the, what on earth was going on for about two years. So don't be, uh, you know, don't be surprised if it takes a little bit of time to get to grips with this. Although it logically appears to be so simple. I don't know. You have to figure that out for yourself. It's something to do with the conflict between your primitive brain and your cerebral cortex probably arguing with each other, I don't know. But they're there for a reason. And, of course, that would be your survival when you were a caveman. <laughs> I love bringing the caveman stories in. Uh, <laughs> you, you love your caveman stories. Yeah, well, a, a caveman, you see. Uh, can they hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I mean, you know, I, I talk always talk about the caveman standing at the entrance of the cave with his spear, right? And his wife's in the back there with the children and the fire and all the rest of it. <clears throat> but the caveman had to have, see, men, they enjoy taking a bit of risk, right? They're not all cold and logical like a computer. They enjoy having a little go. You know, they get a pleasure out of it. They get a pleasure of going to play a game of tennis and beat, beating somebody, right? But you, they beat somebody that's allegedly better than they are. That's where the pleasure comes in. But 
you've got all this to contend with. And uh, if you can think carefully about it and try to, uh, I would almost suggest you write a, a list, that, a checklist that you should really have to check before you trade. The market seems to be coming off quite dramatically at the moment, Look. Because of the no demand at point C here that I'm Oh, yes. Okay, well, I'll hand you back the gab for now. Okay, yeah, so um, we're, we're seeing the market fall, and, and, and this sequence up here, which we're going to talk about in the PowerPoint slides, is a sequence. Okay, and I'm actually taking a, a, a screenshot of this, which I'll put into the PowerPoint and send you, because it's a good example of how weakness appears. Here's your supply coming in. Here's more supply. Notice the narrowing of the spread on this bar here. And then we have no demand. And it's being confirmed. As soon as the market starts to move down through the low of that bar, that, even against the trend, is a potential short. The reason being, they're going to come down to 14.25 and retest this area. It happens quite frequently. So I've put here, the buying appears at A, as Tom explained, and it's tested at B. And that causes the price to go up two or three points. But then an opposing principle appears. Here, we see weakness. And then at point C, the weakness is, is confirmed. So I'll put at point C, the weakness that has now appeared. You saw this happen live. So this is, this is important. It's confirmed. So through this session and through all of our sessions, if Tom sees a principle live, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to screenshot it and add it to the PowerPoint and send it to you. So let's save that and call it Tom1 and save it to my desktop. Okay. And if we go back and actually have a look at the chart, you can see that the market has indeed fallen on very high volume. It's taken out its prior support. And now you'd expect the market to come and retest 14.26. However, we'll come back to that. We're going to do plenty of live charts as we go through. Now, Richard Wyckoff, one of you said you didn't know who he was. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, and thank you for telling us. Here is a website that's got everything you need to know about Wyckoff for your study. And here is a website that explains who the players are. And when I say the players, the teachers, the educators, and the people that really are a part of what we're going to show you over the coming five days. And I'll put that link up as well. And Dr. Dayton, Dr. Gary Dayton here, uh, has just come back from Australia and uh, Malaysia and Singapore with me. Philip Friston is a, a fund manager, a fund manager here in England. Tom, you all know, David Weiss has invented the Weiss Wave and is a Wyckoffian expert. Tim Raymond won a trading competition, not once but twice, using VSA in Forex. Richard Ney wrote a book, several books actually, but three of them I, I, I think are great books. Making It in the Markets was one about how the markets are manipulated. And Jesse Livermore wrote books on the market. He was the smart money, but he wanted to help people too. And then, of course, you've got Wyckoff. I don't know why we've got two Tom Williamses there, but obviously he's very important. And then, of course, there's me as well. So Wyckoff taught us why the market moved. Now, Wyckoff also taught us the key points to trading. And here they are. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this PowerPoint as part of this slide. Um, Jitendra, good to see you, says, can you have full volume area? two please underneath i think you mean can you have the yeah i think i did take the screenshot of that underneath here so you you want a screenshot of the bigger picture is that what you're talking about detender because i can take a screenshot of that later yeah i'll do that later on i want to see how this develops and we'll take another screenshot of this trade setup as it as it develops so what do we look at when we're looking at a chart we look at the big picture we look at more than one bar. Most traders that I know that are not making money tend to look at only the right edge of the chart and they're using maybe a technical analysis tool like a stochastic or a moving average. But the stochastic and the moving average can be your enemy if not used correctly. Why? Let's go and have a look.
As this market rallied, a 20-day moving average at this resistance level would be giving buy signals. Everything in Trade Guider says at this moment in time, the market is going up. The diamonds are green. And if I put the colored bars on, you'll see that they've turned blue. But why do I need to look at the background? Because I've got a clear resistance level to my left. There was selling pressure on a very high volume bar back in February. Then why is February relevant to today? Okay, It's relevant because the market's gone back up there. And look at the volume now as it gets up to this top. But look at the narrow spread on the bar. Then it's confirmed a few bars later with no interest in higher prices, with a bar that closes lower. And I've got a screenshot of this to show you. That's called no demand at a market top. And it's all about the background. Notice one of the things that Tom taught me, which is I'm going to get him to talk to you about now, is support and resistance levels and the importance of trend lines. Now, in Tom's shed, I think you've still got it, is this seven-foot ruler. Yeah. And I'm going to get a picture with you and your ruler. We'll send that to everybody with the DVD. Okay. Now, what was the importance of drawing trend lines and support resistance levels on a chart when you were working for the syndicate? And why do you think they're so important? You, on all your seminars, you put trend lines on, and you say, look, it hit the bottom trend line, it hit the top trend line, and the market seems to respond at those levels uncannily. There doesn't seem to be a reason for it. We don't know why these lines work. But explain to the group now why trend lines and support resistance lines are vital in their analysis. Well, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Okay, well, we know that so-called trend channels work, right? And that's why I, I don't feel at all comfortable looking at the chart unless it's decent trend lines drawn on it. Now, I realized that in the early days when I was instructing the, the programmer to, to uh, what to put into the software. And uh, luckily, he, he picked it up pretty quickly. And the computer loves all this stuff of projecting a potential trend line, even if you can't see it, way into the future. Because believe it or not, whenever the data, if the data, if, it may not reach the trend line, but if it ever reaches that trend line in the future, you can bet your bottom dollar something will happen. And uh, then what you do, you can see more or less what's happening at that resistance level or support level, way into the future. Uh, for example, if you saw an upper trend line, and the market went up there, and of course it gapped up, and you had a very narrow spread, very high volume. You know that's a potential signal coupled up with the the fact is it's, it's right at the top of the trend, trend channel, which makes it vulnerable to professional money. Lots of them do trade on these trend lines, because they'll keep that in mind as well. Um, well like Shirley, that trades all on trend lines. Mike Shirley. Yeah, the, the, the fund manager. Yeah, you know Mike. From what, Danny Swansea? Yeah. Mm. Oh, does he? He looks trend lined all the time, yeah. Oh, no wonder he runs VSA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, there you are. Gavin said that there's this fund manager that uh, is very active down in Swansea, Wales here in England. And um, he, he trades mostly on trend lines because they work. But we can go a step further than that. When the data, or if the data reaches those lines, right, you better read the market at those points, which is very interesting. And of course, uh, a past level of resistance or support is also important. Gavin calls them trigger, trigger levels. And that's also important. Um, for example, if you see a widespread down closing on the low, with a slight increase in volume, not excessive, but not low, as it rushes towards a former area of support, which would be to your left, that's a sign of weakness, potential sign of weakness, which I think we saw last Friday. Well, we did see it last I'm Friday. I'm showing them the chart, gold daily, which had exactly everything you're describing. By the All way, right, so. well, gold, apparently Gab's got gold up. Um, so it's a very, very interesting 
Wyckoff, right, which was a trader uh, 100, 150 years ago, whatever it was, um, he more or less told everybody how to draw trend lines. If the market is bullish, if it, in other words, if it's going up with support levels higher, then you draw your trend line between the first two lows and the corresponding first high and project them well into the future. And of course, the computer does that for you automatically. And if you ever look at those trend clusters, I personally don't use them, to be quite honest. Um, I just concentrate on reading the bars on the live chart. But I've looked at them, and they're fascinating. How the volume doesn't seem, the closing price doesn't seem to like to be in within the body of the trend cluster. It seems to, uh, doesn't like it. And it's quite interesting if you look at it. But you know what's going on there. Now, why these uh, trend lines work? I've never really put the thought into it to sit down long enough to try to figure it out. Can you just tell the group, I've just drawn a trend line on the E-mini S&P futures daily chart so they can see how it works. Gavin just says he's just drawn a trend line on the E-mini futures. But I'm sure there's a lot There's a lot of clever of you people out there. And it's something to do with herd behavior, obviously, because you can draw a trend line on any subject in the world as long as you've got data and this is data and that's what we're blessed with from the stock market because we have all the data I mean for house prices if you had correct data you could do the same thing and would probably predict movement of house prices extremely well if you had the data uh, I don't know perhaps some people do but there is something called the case Schiller which does exactly that and it showed no demand on the weekly chart I've actually done it. I'll show you. Well, Gavin, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Yeah, there is indeed a, a, a data that you can get for the housing market and the CME group. It's called the Case-Shiller Index. Some of you may know, know that. Um, and so you can see that at the moment, housing is showing no demand as the market is trying to go up. And, and that's why, if we, I mean, I'm actually in the process of looking for property here in England and also in America and France, I'm looking at three different properties, and the same thing is happening in all three places, is there's lots and lots of property on the market, which means supply is overcoming demand. There's m too much property, and that's because people have got underwater with their mortgages and all sorts of things like that. So we see that there's a lot of supply in the market. So as it tries to go up, People are just sitting on the sidelines waiting for prices to fall further. And Tom and I watched a very interesting program last night about the tulip market, didn't we? In Holland. In Holland, years ago, hundreds of years ago. 200 years ago. 200 years ago. How they marked the price up, marked the price up, and everyone was trying to buy these tulip bulbs until finally very wealthy people were sitting on these big tulip bulbs, hundreds, even thousands of them, trying to sell them to the next person. And suddenly, at an auction... In Amsterdam, I think it was, they decided that uh, oh, this is ridiculous. It's a case Schiller, uh, Lars. Case Schiller, C A C E, and then Schiller is S C H I W L E R, Lars. And good to see you, by the way, Lars. Case Schiller Index. And um, interestingly enough, we watched the program as we were preparing for the mentorship course today, and we both laughed. We said, well, "This is the market, isn't it? They get these." tulip bulbs they mark them up they mark them up they mark them up get everyone excited at the top and then suddenly there's no demand and the whole thing falls and in fact at the very chart that tom is looking at right now the 15 minute s p that's exactly what's happening uh the market if we look at the chart here has gone up here been marked up then there's no demand at this level just here and then there's more no demand and that's why it's fallen. And we're now going to talk about why that happened. So Dave's asking, what's the multicolored background in the volume chart? OK, this is built into the program uh, and it defines when we have unusually high volume. If it's in this salmon colored area, we know that the volume is unusual. And if it's down here at the bottom in any of these bands below the blue line, it's unusually low volume. 
So here's your high volume on a down bar. The next bar closes up. We get a test. Notice the volume is less than the previous two bars. That's why the market went up. Now we get more unusual volume coming in on this bar. And as the market tries to rally through that level, the volume now diminishes. It's a narrow spread, close in the middle. And the next bar, this is important, closes lower. No demand. That is tradable. If you want to short those areas, that is a tradable short. And let's go and have a look at some of these. Let's talk about the key points of Wyckoff. Always look at the big picture. Use 500 bars or more. Sometimes I use 1,000 bars. And look at more than one time frame. It's very important to not just study one time frame. It, I study three or four time frames in the markets I trade. I don't try to study more than that. Usually four time frames are enough for me, depending on what I want to do. Now, what do I mean by that? Do I want to swing trade a currency position, which means I'm looking to be in the trade for three, four, five days, possibly a week, even longer? Well, if I'm going to do that, I'm not interested in a five-minute and a three-minute chart. In fact, I'm probably going to be looking at the hourly and the, uh, the certainly the four-hour chart, and I might use a 15-minute chart as well, but that's the smallest time frame I would use for swing trading. Now, let's say I'm doing a seminar with an audience like we're doing on Friday. I want to get, it in, get in and out of the market quite quickly to make some money. Then I'm going to start to look at smaller time frames. I tend to use nothing lower than a three-minute chart. Uh, but I have, when the market's moving quickly, used a one-minute chart. But three-minute, five-minute, 15-minute charts are very good time frames to trade. Those three, and I know Dr. Dayton uses similar time frames to me, to move in and out the market fairly quickly. And remember, you can be in a trade for a week and make $5,000. You can be in a trade for an hour and make $5,000. That's the thing about the market. Depends on your strategy. You best define for yourself what your own strategy is. So look at the big picture. As I said, always look at a minimum of about 500 bars first, as we'll show you. Then start to look for Yao Ming bars. Now, what are they? Well, they're massive volume bars. Yao Ming is a basketball player, used to play with the Houston Astros or the Rockets, one of the two. I'll have to get that right one day. And he's seven foot six. He's a human being. And he's very tall. So remember, volume is activity. And it's the activity that we're looking for. So everything starts for me personally with Yao Ming. If I see unusual volume, I always remember when I first moved to Chicago 10 years ago, I'm now back in England. I walked into an office and the guys would come up and say, hey, what's going on? What's going on? That was, that was everyone says it, what's going on? And I, I always thought to myself, what do, what do they mean by that? So when I apply it to trading and someone says, what's going on? I see Yao Ming and a price bar with high volume, and I say to myself, what's going on? What is going on? Some group or groups have become active. There is activity. I better be alert. There's a trading setup coming. That is the first part of the setup, Yao Ming. Uh, Daniel's telling me it's the Houston Rockets. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. So it's the Houston Rockets. that, that Yeah, I'm going to make a note of that from now on. It's the Houston Rockets. So we look for Yao Ming bars. Then we look at the trend of price. Are we in an uptrend? Are we in a downtrend? Are we in a sideways trend? Always look at the big picture because you really want to be trading in harmony with the trend of price. Grigory asks, should we look for the widespread? Very good question, Grigory. I actually look for the narrow spreads. They're much more exciting on high volume. Widespread bars are good. Narrow spread bars are better. Write that down. Widespread bars are fine, but narrow spreads on ultra high volume, hey, get excited, you're going to make some money here. Because narrow spreads on high, especially ultra high volume, tell you something's capping the market. Something's putting a lid on it, as we're about to see. My favorite short is uh, what Tom taught me, is the end of a rising market. It's that's why I'm short gold right now. 
the end of a rising market. It's a, my favorite signal, especially when it's confirmed with a no demand bar just after it. And that's exactly what we saw with gold. So look for a change in behavior in the market. Gold changed behavior a few weeks ago. It was going up and now it's going down. It changed behavior because of the end of a rising market. Look for when the smart money are accumulating or distributing an instrument. Everything works on accumulating, which is buying and distributing. But remember, when professionals distribute, they do so on up bars. That's a price bar that closes higher, not lower, than the bar behind it. And then look at trigger numbers. We're going to talk a lot about these on Wednesday and Thursday. Triggers are areas of support and resistance in the background where the market reapproaches that level and you get a clear indication from the smart money of what they're doing. And if you don't believe that statement to be true, just have a look here at the gold daily chart and have a close look at what's going on. And you'll see it's all in the chart. Look, there's my trigger number which is the red line, okay? It's there for a reason. It's the top of the previous ultra-high volume bar. Here, we have a gotcha bar. The market gets sold off here and causes the market to fall. Here, they mark the market up, up to this level, and it goes through it, but there's no volume. There's no activity to take it higher. That is no demand at market top, and that's why gold has fallen and I think will continue to fall. We may have up days, but at the moment, it's weak. So when accumulation and distribution happens, it's the composite operator or the smart money. So Tom, let me ask you, Wyckoff used the term composite operator. And Wyckoff taught us to look for accumulation and distribution. Can you, number one, explain what the composite operator is? And number two, explain the concept of accumulation and distribution. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Right. Well, as we've said, Gavin talks about the smart money or the professional money. These are individual traders that can throw 5,000, 4,000 contracts into the arena, and that's how they do their business. However, we know that during the phase of what we call accumulation, there'd be more than one individual there because professional money, they tend to follow each other, especially those on the floor or in the exchanges. They can see what the other, they can read and see what's going on and they may very well join. And that's why they, uh, Wyckoff called them the composite operator. That volume or that area is composed or a composite of all those professional money and to manufacture uh, or generate an up move we you need to accumulate the underlying stock that's floating around in the stock market right and they will do this at certain times and that's why it takes serious money to absorb and that's why you see very high volume coming in on these down bars as they're buying, as they're accumulating the underlying stock there. And then as it goes, sometimes it takes some time to accumulate or remove all the suppliers floating around in the market. And if they're bullish, they will accumulate. I mean, I worked for a syndicate, and that's what they did, and that's all they did. Uh, don't forget that when I was there, there was no futures. There was, wasn't anything, really. All there was 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 uh, you couldn't even trade the indexes. Um, it was individual stocks and shares, uh, of course, options and commodities. And be quite honest, remember telling me, oh, we don't like commodities, they're too risky. So they weren't in the business of, of taking too much risk either, which was, which was good, a feather in their cap, right? But they would accumulate a, under, a stock, the under, what they call the floating supply. In other words, when a company launches, they have so many shares on offer. Now, most of those shares are taken up by directors. They're taken up by banks for loans. 
Uh, they're in the drawers of people that never look at them at the bottom there. But so what is left floating around that's available is what they call the floating supply. And if you time your buying right in conjunction with the general market, you'll find that you will be able to control that stock and mark it up or down more or less at will. And then that's what generates a bull market. And uh, believe me, that goes on. There were 300 syndicates doing that when I was there in America. 300. And they don't seek publicity. The, 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 the group I work with, uh, Century Towers, Beverly Hills, right, you went into this building up to the floor, and you go up to this door, and it's bare. Looks like, I mean, a toilet has more marks on it than their, their door. <laughs> it was absolutely nothing. And you go in there, and there's all these smart guys there accumulating and trading stock and shares for their money and others. And that's how they made their money. So that is accumulation, which has to take place. I mean, that chart I showed you 15 minutes earlier on, the high volume was them absorbing the supply that was there at that moment. Right, and then the test showed that that supply had been removed, and that's what you've got that small up move for going on. But that's a general idea, but that's only a 15 minute chart. Remember, accumulation, you, you need to really see a daily chart or even a weekly chart, you could see them at work. And, uh, but that's accumulation. And then once they've accumulated, and you have a bull move or an up move on your hands, Right, then they have to at some time or other sell, in other words, distribute. And who do they sell? They have to sell back to the herd, the public, the banks, even fund managers. People that are vulnerable to seek performance will be looking to buy. And of course, they get sucked into the market after these bullish up moves and all the good news is coming out. Everything's wonderful. And they have to distribute. And that will, in turn, make the market weak. And that's accumulation and distribution. Then you get the variations between, I suppose, when nothing much is happening. But once you learn to read these charts, your skill as a trader will kick in. And if you can master uh, that and master your own feelings and judgment so that you're not overcome by this primitive brain that you've got arguing with your cortex, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, then you'll be fine. Okay, I've got a question for you. Right, so uh, Lance is here, and he's got a question. So Lance, I'm just opening your mic up now. Uh, how, are you, how are you today, Lance? Very well, thank you, and yourself? Ah, very good, yeah, yeah, no, not bad at all, and uh, in fine form is the master. Uh, you, you've got some questions, Lance, so shoot away. Yeah, hello, Tom. Lance says hello. Um, hi, Lance. He says hi, Lance. <laughs> yeah, basically, it's back to that gold chart. Um, mm -hmm. If you could just put that up a second. Yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, let me just move my uh, control panel out of the way. Um, yeah, it's quite clear to see that the market sort of coming up to a resistance level and gets sold off. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got the, the gotcha bar. Um, which is plain to see yep. what's really happening. And that follows, like you said, with the market being sold off. And then what we what we get to is, I can't quite pick it out on the chart, but could you put where the spring light bar is, where it's sort of accumulated at the bottom? Down here. Yeah, um, the actual spring light bar, there, the, 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 the bar what goes into fresh new low ground. Down here. Yeah, what's the volume there? Now, now there... Let's let's assume that um, we got short on the on the on the wave down. Mm -hmm. Is that volume on? Uh, I it's easy to see Gavin on the chart, but in real time as that's happening, is that volume enough to say okay that market's now going to start to drift sideways and change behaviour and go back up to that? Res that resistance uh, level? No, there's no way of knowing at that point. I mean, that volume is not ultra high. It's pretty average. So at that no. point, if I'm short, 
Uh, let's say I've sh I, I would be short from this gotcha bar up here. And I'm now short gold, actually, on the no demand bar. But let, forget, forget that for a second. Let's say we've gone short on this bar here. All right, so you're short on the gotcha bar. You've got two things that are going on here. You've got weakness in the background. You've, you've got selling pressure. The volume is, that is a high volume up bar. So let's say you're now short. Now, where do you get out the trade? That's a good question. Yes, yes. That's All right. And there's two ways of doing it. Okay. Now, I use, you can use the software to use what we call these H stops. Okay. Now, these H stops here on the daily chart will give you an idea of where to put a stop. But there's something else that we've got in the software. If you hit Control D, can you see now there's a chandelier stop system here? This is basically a line. The idea of trading. And, and, and what you're trying to do, once you're in a winning position, there's two objectives you've got. Number one, get your stop to break even. Okay, so that's the first objective I always have, is get my stop. Because, you know, as soon as I take a trade and I'm in the market at a price, I know that I'm going to have a stop that involves me losing money if it goes against me. You with me so far? Yeah, yeah I, so, I, I understand that, yeah. Right, so so then the next objective, if the market moves in my favor, is to give myself enough breathing room so that if it goes and zips up and down, I don't get stopped out, but I want to get the stop to break even. Now, I probably can show you the trade that I took on the British pound, which will show you this in a bit more detail. Okay. All right. So here, now, I think you were in the seminar last week when I actually said there was a short on an up thrust in the British pound, and we actually got this bar here. This is what actually happened. This was last Thursday when I did the seminar. And I actually shorted an up thrust on a 15-minute chart. Now, you can see here that the up thrust came, I think it was around on this bar here on a 15-minute chart. It was, it was showing supply on an hourly chart, but it was confirmed, and we were changing behavior. The market was in a downtrend. Now, this is the sort of move you're looking for. doesn't happen all the time. But it does happen where the market is marked down and we have a, a very high volume bar. Now, the question is, do I want to, you know, I've got high volume on a down bar here. Is that enough suffice for me to say, hey, I'm going to take my money and get out the trade? Well, the software tells me, no, bring your stop down to this level here. Bring yeah. it down. So now I'm in profit. I can't lose money. In fact, I was about 80 ticks up at, the, at that point. So what so happened? Money management, money management dictates whether you get out or stay in them. Yeah, Co correct. Software, the money management software dictates it. I correct. Understand. Correct. That's exactly right. Is is what you're doing? Is unless I see an obvious principle that is obvious, the market's going to reverse. Then I, then I might say, hey, I'm going to close my position. But what I do is chase the market. That's what I call it. You'll see me do this in very small time frames and. Again, in big ones, too. I mean, if I get a position that moves quickly, like this, this one here happened in an hour, in one hour. It was, I was already short. I'd already got my stop up here, and the market then took off. And I know several of you in the room, by the way, who emailed me, took, <laughs> took the same trade. So this trade worked very well because it's a gotcha bar, isn't it? It's taken out all the prior support, as we can see here. All the support's gone in that market. Now, there's something else to note about this level. It's right near a round number. The markets get drawn to round numbers. I don't know why. 1.600. Okay. Now, I got stopped out of the trade at 1.6025, Gling. You were asking there. Um, I, so I actually took my profit there. But what we notice about this market now is the bottom of that bar will now act as resistance. And I'm going to come to this on, on Friday when we do live trading. But if the market goes back up to that level on no demand, and if it happens today, you're going to watch me take another trade. I'm going to short it. I'm not going to hesitate. I'm going to short it. Because, yes, we've got some buying going on here. Yes, it's been tested. And, yes, the price is rallying. But that, even though it's got a green signal on it, to me, tells me, yes, there's an effort to stop the market, but it's then must be weak because the next bar closes lower over here. This next signal, this weak bar, tells me that they're testing and it's failed. So there's selling going on up here. So Lance, in answer to your question, which is a good one, if I take a trade short and I've gone short, I look at the volume, yes, 
but I will move my stop to break even and then to start. Once I'm in profit, I want to let that trade run as long as I can. Because remember, professionals, if they're going to buy, will buy on down bars. So if I'm short and they're bullish, they want to buy at lower prices, I'm going to make money as they mark it down. Make sense? Yeah, I think it's just a, a weakness I've got, and I need to address it ASAP because I just don't use stops for some stupid reason. But okay. Yeah, you, you, you need to use stops in the market at all points. You, you can't I, – I, seriously, I, I – I, 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 know, I know, Gavin, and, you, you, you know, I forgot about the stop management sim, system in the software, which was why I asked the question because I don't use stops. I forgot that it is actually in the software, and that's ultimately what dictates whether – I stay in that trade or not. So. Uh, well, it's a great point you make. And let me just tell you a quick story. There was a trader a few years ago, uh, a trade guide, a customer, who took a $10,000 account trading silver and made $300,000 in six months. This is a true story. And he actually was very, very, very bullish on silver and decided one day not to put a stop in because he didn't want to get stopped out of his position. And he basically said, well, I don't need a stop now. He didn't even have an emergency stop. And he was leaving the position open on the basis that if anything happened, he would be able to call the broker and sort it out. Well, silver is heavily manipulated. And on the day that he was not looking at his computer, silver had its biggest one-day fall. It was catastrophic. It went 28% down. So his $300,000 that he had in the morning, by the time he got back at lunchtime, was a $25,000 debit against his account. So the lesson I said to him, and I'll say it to you, always put a stop in the market. By the way, even with a stop in the market, there is no guarantee that you'll get a fill. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. There's no guarantee, but a stop at least is if, if you've got, uh, I mean, my broker, Infinity, I've never had a problem with a stop. I've always been taken out the market. They have a very good system. But, um, you know, you've got to... I think a lot of it's a bit of paranoia as well, because before um, I started trading, I was reading things like the brokers, they know where your stops are, they stop you out on purpose. <laughs> so yeah. I thought, well, I mm, Yeah, I know you're right. They do see the stops. And in fact, um, I'll get Tom to talk about that in a minute, which is why I use a slightly wider stop than most traders, retail traders would use. So I've got a slightly wider stop because... I'll trade less size with a wider stop than trade more size with a close stop. Most retail traders are taught wrongly by educators that trade a bit of size but use a tight stop for risk. That's wrong. That is Sorry, that is wrong. The smart money see your stops and will go and get the stops, and that's, and that's what they do. So, Lance, by the way, great question, mate, and uh, I'll close your mic, but thanks very much. Great comment. And uh, again, I encourage you, if you want me to open your mics up uh, and you've got questions, don't be shy. I mean, we're here to help you. But that was a good example there, and it was a very good question. Okay, so how do markets work in phases? Well, they most definitely do. This is a compliments of um, the SMI course, which is the Stock Market Institute. Tom, you took this course, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, so Tom knows all about this. Now, markets move, move in phases. And knowing what phase you're in is determining whether you're going to be long or short. Now, looking at this chart at the moment, can anyone tell me which phase we are in, A, B, C, D, or E, in the stock markets around the world? Which phase do you think we're in? Type it in, everyone. Let's get a vote. Let's get a consensus of opinion from the team here. What phase are we currently in? In these markets so far you're all pretty much right okay I'm just letting everyone type in there's quite a few people actually who think they're typed in a they were in this phase we're completely not in this phase that was 2008 we're here let me show you why I'm just going to open my end-of-day software for a second. Now, it's very interesting that several of you typed in, in fact, more than several of you, actually, and this is because a lot of you will have typed in A there because the sentiment about the market at the moment on the television and on the media 
is a negative sentiment, but the truth is in the chart. Okay, the truth is in the chart. The chart doesn't lie. Now, I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to show you a chart of the cash S&P, and I'm going to ask you the same question. So let's bring up the PowerPoint for a second. So let's just refresh our memories. Here are the phases. Phase A is a bear market. Phase B is buying or accumulation. Phase C and D is building the cause for the next move. Remember, this will be an old high to the left. And phase E is a bull market. Okay, so okay, so I'm now showing you the chart of the weekly S&P. Let's just make sure that is weekly. I'm pretty sure it is. There. There's the weekly chart of the S&P cash. Okay, so I'm going to ask you all again. All right, I'm going to show you the screen here. Which phase now do you think we're in now we look at the chart? Are we in phase A, B, C, D, or E when you look at the chart? What do you think? And if I put up more bars, it will give you a clue. Where do you think we're in now? Well done. Everyone's typing in E right now. We are definitely in phase E. Yep, TP, absolutely right. We are in a pullback right now in an uptrend. Now, can anyone explain the significance of that bar there to me before we take a break for a few minutes? What is the significance of that bar where I've got my cursor on? Look at the volume, look at the bar. What is the significance of that bar? Ah, well done, Grigory. I like your explanation there. Grigory says it's the radar to change the trend. Well, the trend was already going up at this level. All right, let's ask another question of the group. What's the significance of that bar there, then, on that volume? So the bar that I'm highlighting... I want you to look very closely at three things. I want you to look at the range of the bar. I want you to look at the closing price, and I especially want you to look at the volume. But then I want you to look at the date of the bar. And there's a clue. What do you observe? You can see the date at the top left-hand corner of your screen. What happened on that day or that week? Come on. Let's see if a few people start typing this in. What happened... 7th of May, the week of 7th of May, 2010. It's, it's written about in many, many, many... Ah, well done. Yes, yes, it was the flash crash. It was. But look at what I've done to the closing price of the flash crash bar. Look at the closing price. One, 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 one. Is there any accidents in numbers? No. That was deliberately done. One, 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 one. Okay, and it's that's where it went to. Almost to the tick. Okay, now you've got to see this stuff, everyone, because if you don't understand the significance of the numbers, you won't be able to make money in the markets. One, 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 one. Okay, and it was done on the 7th of May, of the week of, and it actually was the 6th of the 5th, 2010. So it was 6-5. 2010, 1111 was the number. Now, project that number out into the future. What happens? Where does the price go on the 12th of August, of the week of the 12th of August? Okay, it comes through that number, that closing price, and rebounds. So, do you all agree with me? There must be buying at that level, yes or no? Is there buying? Do you agree? There's buying on, this, on these bars. Absolutely there's buying. That is why we're in a bull market. That's why we're going up, not down. And the volume on the flash crash was the same as the volume on the week of the 12th of August, 2011. What was the news, everybody, on the week of 12th of August, 2011? What happened that week? Anyone remember? 
It was all over the media. What happened during that week? Something major happened. Yes, everyone was told to buy gold. That's true. What, what else happened? Correct. Correct. Well done. The US government was downgraded that week. And the news was everyone selling their stocks and buying gold. And this is n exactly why you should have been buying stocks and selling gold like Tom and I did. I bought Apple that week. And you can see that that would be a great buy down there because the market was tested a few weeks later and we moved up towards 1500. It's all in the volume. Always look at the weekly chart as well. If you have some really bad news and the price falls, look at the volume. The chart doesn't lie. So we are indeed in phase E or D, according to this, and E here. We've changed trend. We're actually, I think, somewhere around here in the market. Okay, we're somewhere around phase E. Michael says this is brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Good. That's what we do. We teach you the truth. And once you see it in front of your own eyes, light bulbs go off and you go, well, why did I miss that? Well, you miss it because you're influenced by everything around you, which allows you, if you're not a volume expert, to miss the telltale signals on the chart. But we are here right at this dip. And I think we're ready to go up. But we need a shakeout. We expect a shakeout which is bad news and a down move. And that's what the market does. But we have definitely defined a new trend. We are in this phase right now. We're in a reaccumulation phase in the market. And until I see an opposing principle, which is ultra high volume, massive volume coming in, on an up bar, I'm not going to start thinking about shorting. Do I take shorts on a weekly basis? Sure, there are, there are short trades that we can take. But we are most definitely accumulating, not distributing at the moment. So Wyckoff, before we take a break, let's look at this. Studied market action based on volume price. Oh, Sean, I'm referring to the stock markets around the world. Let me be clear. Do not, when I talk about the markets, I'm referring to the stock market unless I specifically say gold, silver, oil. So when I talk about the stock markets, I'm talking about uh, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, the FTSE. Okay, just to be clear on that, it's a good question. When I'm referring to gold, gold is in a distribution phase. It's not in an accumulation phase. Okay, gold has been distributed. So I will be very specific about that. So Wyckoff studied market action based on volume price. Wyckoff would determine where risk and reward were optimal for trading. Wyckoff studied the psychology of trading and why the smart money buy and sell at certain times. Wyckoff explained to us the shifts between what he called the weak holders to the strong holders. I call the strong holders the smart money. And Wyckoff introduced the term composite operator, which I don't think Tom really covered, but it really means the consensus of opinion amongst the professional money. That's what it means, the consensus of opinion amongst the professionals so which one are you you're going to be here this is the losing traders the losing people on the market the herd you will become the smart money you will because you're already getting information that will give you an advantage over this group the markets will always move on supply and demand they will always do what VSA identifies because the herd and human behavior is not going to change dramatically. Okay, and when I and, and TP is asking me where do I think gold will be supported at uh, 1550 is the key level. TP, if it gets down below 1700 at the moment, you'll see 1550 retested. If it goes through there, it's going to a thousand, and everyone's going to be who's long and was a gold bug. It's going to be scratching their heads. And the reason for it, TP, is that the, the governments are manipulating the price. It's all to do with governments. And they have enough money. By the way, they print it. So they can, they can come in and attack that market and keep gold prices down whenever they want to, which is why I like 
trading it. Has electronic markets made a significant difference? No, Michael, it's made it better. Because remember, electronic markets still report volume. So it's actually improved the BSA analysis. Hasn't actually gone backwards, it's got better. That's why I'm opening a hedge fund now. For that reason. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, what's the time? It is, um, by the way, you all enjoying this? Is uh, everyone enjoying this? Hopefully we're uh, giving you some good information. You can see that we're not just using standard stuff. We're going through and using actual charts. So um, I hope you're all enjoying it and you're getting something from this. Obviously, you know that Tom and I love doing this. We thoroughly enjoy it. And we've got a lot of stuff to show you. So there's a lot of information you're going to get this week. So um, I'm glad you're all enjoying it. Let's come back then in 20. Let's take a 20-minute break. And let's come back here at 5 to the hour on this clock, which is 5 to 8 a.m. Chicago time. All right. See you then. Um, do, how do you synthesize Tom's trending systems with the chandelier stops? Morris, we'll come to that. It's a good question. We're going to talk about the trending system in part two. So uh, we'll talk about that, Morris. Good question. All right, everyone. See you in about 20 minutes. Take care and uh, be back with you soon. OK, hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Daniel, I saw your question there. And there's a great website that's going to answer a lot of your questions about the Forex markets. It's called babypips.com. I'll type that in. Um, and that will really go through a lot of the information. Pips.com that you're asking there. Also, if you've got questions like that, Daniel, contact Ken Yi who works with Trade Guider in the office in America. And Ken's been trading for 15 years. He trades futures and Forex. He'll be happy to help you, Daniel. So uh, just give Ken a call. OK, can everyone hear me? Let's just do a quick sound check. Uh, and we'll start part two, the major. Yeah, Alan says, is it better to identify accumulation and distribution phases in the daily time frame or can it be done in the 5 and 15 minute? Yeah, it can be done in all three, Alan, to, to answer your question. Um, you'll get a turning point in the market during the day. I mean, on a daily chart, you see the... I mean, Tom's just looking at the weekly chart of the E-mini. And you do see turning points on the big time frames. But you can also see them on the small time frames. In fact, we just saw Tom was looking at a 15-minute chart of today's S&P. And we picked up buying and then selling in a 15 minute time frame. So remember, that's how it works. You can pick up accumulation and distribution in any time frame, believe it or not. Uh, it does actually work. I'll show you. Um, I'll put up a, a chart here. If we go to um, let's just close some of these Aussie stocks that I was looking at. So here's the, here's your pound chart. OK, and we've clearly seen a down move is in place here, without doubt. We've got a gotcha bar there, look. That's a widespread down. That's a weak bar right there. And if we go and have a look at a different time frame, say a five-minute chart, you can see we're in a downtrend on the hourly, but we're in an uptrend that's now beginning to end because of these bars here on the, uh, the five-minute chart. So I'd be inclined, actually, to start to look for potential short trades because here you're making lower highs. So now this trend is aligning nicely in the uh, in the hourly, the four hourly, it's starting to turn down. The bars are red. You've got a signal here, which is your up thrust in a downtrend. No demand at that level. It's not perfect, no demand. It's like a mini up thrust there. It's marked down. So now we're going to look for any signs of weakness at this level. And look, and, and potentially there's a trade here. Gling says there are players in every time frame. That's why VSA works beautifully. Absolutely does. Absolutely does. OK, let's now go to the signs of weakness. Um, TP's asking, how do they attack gold and keep it down? Doesn't printing money cause it to go up? No, that's a that's a fallacy, TP. Basically, um, the best study you can do is go and type in Andrew Maguire's name into Google, and it tells you all about gold and how the um, the Fed um, and, and the large banks work together to suppress gold. It, it, it's not for this seminar because it's not just VSA. If, you, if you're going to get into conspiracy theories, then that's one of them. And it actually is a true one. <laughs> the governments do definitely 
go in and attack the price of gold. But we see we don't care what they do because we can make money when it's on the chart. Simple as that. So signs of weakness. Signs of weakness. So Tom. Now Tom is go, he, he's itching to go and sit in the conservatory and eat his haggis that he's having for dinner tonight. But you have to, I'm sorry, but you have to do your seminar first, Tom. Oh, yeah. but here, for those of you who know anything about Scotland, we're having, I bought Tom a fresh haggis. And don't ask me what's in it, because <laughs> it'll put you off your breakfast or your lunch or your dinner. But Tom, define for us, what is a sign of weakness in VSA? Right, okay. Yeah, we won't be having that haggis till or another four hours or so, uh, two, three, four, five, six, uh, yeah, five hours. So uh, think of me because it's lovely. I love haggis. Uh, it's a real traditional Scottish dish, but as, as Gavin said, don't ask us what's in it. <laughs> anyway, okay, sorry. What's a sign of weakness? A sign of weakness is, uh, can remember... Can you just check everyone can hear you? Can you do a sound check? Can, can everybody hear me? Type in Y if you can hear me. Voice level should be good. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, yeah. good. Gavin says everything's fine. Okay, lovely. Okay, a sign of weakness, S-O-W. Um, okay, remember, professional money, because of the size of their holdings... They have to sell or start to sell as the market is moving up, not down, up. And that's why uh, size of weakness practically always appear on that bar. Right, even if the bar, well, we won't go into too much details, but definitely an up bar. Right, and the bar, of course, will be marked up. The news will be good somewhere uh, as they pump the good news out to encourage people to move into the market. And then as they move in, professional money can unload holdings bought at a lower level. Now, sometimes this can be done quickly. Sometimes it takes time. Uh, markets vary, of course. And But you'll find that if it takes time, they hold the market up, you get a sign of weakness, and it more or less drifts, appears to drift sideways for some time. And, uh, and very often, at the end of that period, you'll get no demand up bar or an up thrust confirming that what's happened before you is a distribution. And sometimes they have to hold the market up. Remember, what causes a bear market is professional money as distributed at the top, and they're not supporting the market. They're not holding it up. And therefore, it'll naturally drift lower. And uh, so that's a weak, a sign of weakness is basically, first of all, you, the market has to be vulnerable. In other words, you have to have an up move behind you. It's no good expected distribution, you know, as the market's fallen. No, it's when it's risen, because we're looking at the supply and demand, and we know that after a market has risen, right, then that's why you see all these signs of weakness we have are practically all on up bars. So the computer can prove to you that what we tell you is true. It's an up bar. That's the one you've got to pay attention to. And that, of course, that's what fools most people out there. Uh, remember, you probably know far more than most of the other people out there do at the moment. And that goes for TV companies, newspaper reporters, and so on and so on. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, but that's a sign of weakness. It'll appear on that bar. And read the dialog box, put the cursor over it, press F1, study it very, very carefully till it's really embedded in your mind, and gradually it'll all make sense to you. I can guarantee that. Okay, thanks, Tom. And here we see, beware of ultra-high volume up bars. They're usually weak bars driven by news. 
Welcome to GoToWebinar, Web Events Made Easy. So, the end of a rising market. How is the sound, by the way, now? Is it better? Is the sound improved? Someone just said the sound quality wasn't too good. It should be better now. I've just actually put uh, another microphone in. Yeah, it's great. Good. Okay, good. Yeah, I think what was, do I think what was happening, it was picking up on the uh, computer mic and not the uh, headset mic. But uh, which is why it might sound a little bit faint, but it, it'll be picked up on the recording, so don't worry. Okay, so my favourite place to short. Hey, Steve, good to see you. Well done, great, Steve. Um, and I'll I'll try and catch up with you later, Steve, uh, and give you a call um, so we can have we can catch up. So, sign of weakness one: the end of a rising market. We love this, don't we, Tom? This is this is this is where you make money. It's an up bar. On a narrow spread, it closes in the middle or low. The volume will be very high or stronger if it's ultra high. Weakness always appears on an up bar. Now, I say always. There are one or two exceptions, but usually. Because professional selling has to come into a surge of buying. The narrow spread indicates supply has hit the market. Something has put a lid on the top of the market. And that's Tom's expression. Something's capping it. Selling, or just lack of demand from professional money, are the only two things that can do this. If the volume is ultra high, this will show a serious sign of weakness. Now, keep that in mind. If the volume is ultra high, start to get excited. You're about to make a lot of money. This sign of weakness should have the following. Okay, now I'm going to show you two examples of the end of a rising market. I'm going to show you one in my favorite stock, JP Morgan, JPM, and we're going to look at gold. So the end of a rising market, Tom, is probably your favorite signal as well to short. Describe to us why it's such a powerful principle and why is it that the public, the general public, the herd, will be totally unaware of what's going on. Here's Tom. Right, thanks, Jeff. Well, at the end of a rising market, uh, most people are completely unaware of what's going on because they don't understand volume. They don't understand how the market works. And, of course, that goes for most of the media and TV companies. I've actually heard them on TV saying, oh, the market's shot up, look, it's even gapped up, the volume is high, that's all buying. Of course, the volume's high. It has to be buying. That's why it went up. They can't see any other logic at all, right? But at the end of a rising market, we've got a signal that appear on it, and there's two criteria you've got to keep in mind. First of all, you've got to have an up move behind you. In other words, a bull move behind you. Secondly, if that's gapped up into fresh high ground, in other words, there's nothing much to the left, right? then you can bet your bottom dollar that is the end of a rising market. And you can certainly short that straight away. Uh, but very often, if there's been a big bull move behind you, they will want to support the market as they distribute more on every little wave up that arrives. And uh, so, But that's the end of a rising market. And the computer will definitely pick that up, hopefully. It should do. Um, when you see that, you could be rest assured that is the end of a rising market. But remember, if it's up in fresh high ground, in other words, there's nothing at that level to the left for some time. If you ever see that in the future, you can guarantee that's the end of a rising market. Right? And you've got a bull move behind you. That makes the market vulnerable to one or more groups taking advantage of this to sell their holdings that they bought lower levels. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, and, it, and it's exactly what we're looking for uh, right now. If we ever see this in the stock markets around the world, we're all going to make a lot of money shorting it. So a few weeks ago, I did a seminar uh, predicting that gold would fall and many of you have already commented on the YouTube video that I did. And again, it was done in foresight, not hindsight. And it says here, 
gold falls, U.S. data wor feeds worried Fed could curb stimulus. All right, this is after gold had been marked up. So on October the 12th, as predicted by Trade Guider and VSA, gold fell nearly 1%, its biggest daily drop in more than two months, as improving U.S. customers, consumer sentiment and jobs data stirred concern the Fed might curb the monetary stimulus that has boosted gold prices. For the week, gold fell 1.5%, its largest weekly loss since the last week of June. So in the quarter, it was one of the most serious de declines in gold that we'd seen. But it was all predicted. There's the signal in September. The end of a rising market. Now, at point A, what makes that bar interesting is the narrow spread on the bar, narrow range. The next day, we note that the price closes lower, not higher, it closes lower. So something is happening at point A, and we already know that it's at resistance. 1800 is resistance, where my red line is drawn. But notice the market doesn't change behavior at that point. It still manages to go back up. So at point A, my antenna is telling me, yes, something's going on. But it's not until point B that I get very interested in looking for shorts here. And the reason is, look at the volume. At point B, after you've seen the massive volume narrow spread bar at A, You've got no interest in higher prices. It tries to break through the trigger number and fails miserably on the next bar. This is called no demand after serious weakness. So this is called no demand after serious weakness has appeared. Okay, questions coming in from Lance here. Okay, Lance, good for you. I'm glad you're contributing. Lance, uh, your mic's open. What's your question? Yeah, I um, maybe a week or so ago, I've asked you the same question. However, your your, your sort of answer to it was a bit vague um, okay. towards the end of the webinar. So I just want to ask that question again, because for me, if I see an end of a rising market, that for me, I'm shorting it, or you know, I'm going to short it. But what I what I want to know is how do you calculate when that is going to come off? How many days or weeks? Good question. It's 25 you, you bars. Understand my question. Yep, it's Did 20. Uh, yep, it's a perfect question. 25 bars. In, within 25 bars of the end of a rising market, I am looking for no demand. And then I'm looking to make, and I don't short actually, until I see a change in behavior in the smaller time frames. But could you go short on that? Tom does actually. All right. It, Tom just shorts them. Here's the problem though. Look what happens. The market continues to go up. And you know why that happens is the market maker is holding prices up to keep people long, even though he already knows there's a large batch of sell orders in the background. He's trying to keep people long, so or she, because it could be a market maker, could be a male or a female. He or she, that market maker is there on the exchange and they're ensuring that people stay locked in to the position. And why I don't go short straight on that bar. Is, is if you think about it, very logical. And in fact, Lance, let me bring Tom in now. He'll tell you what happened. I, do you remember I shorted the end of a rising market with you? And then there was an upthrust straight afterwards. And you said, and, and Tom said, I, I, I lost about $1,000 on the trade. Right? I got, so we had an end of a rising market like this. And the market went sideways. I went short. And then again, an upthrust. The market went up. And as I'm watching it, I'm watching, oh, my goodness me. I'm going to lose 2.5% of my account here. Bang, I got stopped out. Massive volume, went up. I said, Tom, your signal's completely wrong. I said that, and I was, I was annoyed. I was angry, which is silly at the time. <laughs> and, and, it come in, and, it, and then Tom looked at me and said, Gavin, this was a 15-minute chart, a five-minute chart. He said, you've got to get, get, get back in now. I said, don't be so stupid. I said, the signal's wrong. But he said, no, you, you need to be short now. The upthrust just confirmed the end of a rising market. And guess what happened? I didn't go back in. And the S&P dropped 28 points in two hours. And I would have made probably somewhere in the region with the same trade about $20,000. So I learned from that that the signal and the principle was not wrong at all.
but my timing wasn't particularly good. I, I And you never know with trading, when you take a position, you know that your money's now at risk. And so what I try to do is wait for confirmation bars. Now here in gold, the reason I did the YouTube video last week, we've got confirmation at point B of the serious weakness at point A. Because the market tries to go up through it, which it does. And the trending system hasn't changed here either. The bars are blue. The diamonds are green. But we've gone up. And this time, there's no volume on that up move at all. So that tells me something. If, they, if they're going to break through. And remember, it's at prior resistance. That's the key to this. It, it makes sense to me that they would sell at that level. Because if we look at the chart, we, the actual chart, we know we've got a resistance level to the left. Now, when the end of a rising market appears here, does it fall over the next few days? If you went short, would you have made some money? Potentially, yes. But very often, they'll mark it back up, and there'll be low volume on the mark up the second time. So I tend to wait, and then I look at different time frames to determine my entry. And at the moment, I'm expecting gold to come down to about 1,700 over the next uh, sort of 48 hours, two or three days. But if you wanted to short end of a rising markets when you see them, just remember you could still be vulnerable to further upward move. And I like to say, I wait for the change in behavior. See here, the market makes three lower highs. We make a lower high on each day. So here, we're making higher lows on the bar. Now look, yeah. we make lower, lower lows here, lower low. And that it would interest me because we're making lower lows. And in fact, here, we change behavior completely. We come down, we take out the prior support, we close. Now here, We've got a little bit of support, but the market's gone up, and there's your no demand right there. Look, volume less than the previous two bars. Hasn't got a signal in the software because this little tail is in the bar. But I know that's no demand, and I expect the market to probably come back up into this area on no demand again, and there's another short down to 1,700. Does that make sense, Lance? Yeah, most definitely. So within 25 bars, look generally. For, yep, yeah, and then look for the change of behavior within the 25 bars. And if you see it... You, you yeah, and I like it. I like um, we, we make the lower lows. Yeah, that's a great explanation, Gavin. Thank great. You okay, mate, no worries. Good questions, Lance. Well done. Okay, let's just close your mic off, and there's a couple of other questions coming in here. So bear with me. There's a lot of them, actually. So good questions. Good questions. Okay, and Ron's saying, good point. Yeah, in gold, what would the scanner be saying here? Okay, well, if we look on the live chart right now, Okay, you can see the change in behavior in the market. We can see the diamonds are red. And what have we got that's just happened in gold here? We've got a lovely, lovely trap up move here. Look, look at the volume on that. Now, any no demand bars at that level here, at around 1725, will be good shorts. It will be good shorts. No strength in this market at the moment. It's a weak uh, market. Yeah, um, Peter, I know that problem as well, which is why I've also been using other data feeds to confirm that high volume. Um, was the first sign of distribution on the 13th of the 9th? So, yes, it was. Yeah, it was. And in fact, you can probably see it clearer when we look at a weekly chart of gold. Here is your resistance to the left. There's your trap up move like we've just seen on a smaller time frame. And then the market goes back up almost exactly. Look at the high of that bar. It's at 174, and the high there, 174. Almost exactly, look. And on the GLD contract, which is the uh, electronic contract, you see here, weakness at the same level. And you'll see exactly the same thing here on the weekly chart of the futures contract. There's no demand at that level. OK. Uh, TP is asking, is gold at the end of a rising market in a bull market where it's just pulling back before it resumes to go higher? Well, here's my problem. Here's something you've all got to be aware of with gold. What do we notice about the volume in August of last year on this bar? This is monthly gold futures. What do you notice about the volume on that bar? Just here. Just type in, what do, you, what do you notice? Is it enormous, isn't it, right? Now, look what happened here as the market tried to go up through that bar. 
it was upthrusted and it fell miserably. And now, same sort of things going on. It's coming into the body of these two bars and it's going to need a lot of effort to go through there. Don't get me wrong. Could we see an upthrust in gold? Possibly. But it's not there today and it's not there to be traded at the moment. Definitely not. At the moment, we trade what we see. And on the daily chart, we see the end of a rising market, followed no, by no demand, and gold has dropped from 1800 to 1725 in two weeks. That's a significant move. And it's all in the charts. Another example, one of my favorite ones, it's in my book. Uh, the news. News is usually going to be good. In fact, it will always be good. Because to encourage you to buy, the news will make you think that the market's going to go to the moon. But we know different at VSA and we know different at Trade Guider because we can read the chart. Here is the news on that day and the chart on that day. So let me just go back. Look at the date of the news. Okay. October the 14th, 2009. Now look at what happened. The market gaps up, narrow spread on the bar, closes in the middle. The next day we close almost equal with it. Now that is on good news. Now I'm going to ask Tom, why is it then, Tom, that the news hit? Now this is where people have a problem with the market. The fundamental analysis is good. I mean, the, com the, co the companies come out with great earnings. It's a really, really good stock. It's been going up for weeks. Okay, so the fundamentals, you tick the box and say, well, I should buy it. The price has been going up. You tick the box. You say you should buy it. You then look at the, st the stochastic or the MACD for the last 20 period moving average. It's got buy signals all over it. The candlestick says buy everything except BSA says buy. But we're right. Why? Sorry, I didn't quite get that. So why is the end of a rising market? Oh, the end of a rising, yeah. Why is it that we're right and the market does fall and all the other things <coughs> that we well, use are wrong? Imagine you're a professional trader. All you're interested in movements up and down. You couldn't care less about the fundamentals or you, uh, you may use the news. You're fully aware the news is a useful tool for you uh, to ram the market up and down on the news. Uh, you know other professionals will do it. Um, but the chart, as, as Gavin says, the chart has to tell the truth. If you see a gap up in the fresh high ground, you know, and the volume is ultra high, and you've got a bull move behind you, right, and the news is good, right, at the end of the day, it's gone up on a narrow spread, Volume is ultra high. If you're up in the fresh high ground, now the only thing that can cause that narrow spread like that is something has put a lid on the higher prices. And of course, that lid is that every time a buy order comes in, you satisfy it. You say, right, okay, you want to buy, here we are, you can have some of mine. And they unload their holdings. And uh, that's what makes the market weak. And that's why you have to be. That's what we know the market moves on supply and demand. We can show you it moves on supply and demand. We got these automatic signals that if you think they're pretty good or uncannily accurate, sometimes I say uh, it's it. The rules are built on just what we're telling you. We don't keep any secrets back. We're just telling you the end of a rising market is we t we t instruct the programmer to say right if the market has been in a ball move, it suddenly gaps up in the fresh high ground, the spread is narrow, volume is ultra high, shove a sign of weakness. And we'll type the dialogue box out to confirm that. That's all we do. And uh, there's been quite a few people around the world trying to copy VSA, but it's not quite so easy, apparently, to copy as far as programming is concerned. Um, but as I said, I was lucky to get this programmer years ago that came out of the army after instructing tank, he was a tank instructor. <laughs> and of course, they have to be experts on computer screens because that's how they move those tanks around. In the middle of the night, they go around at 30, 40 knots and uh, in pitch black. Uh, but they're doing it on the screens. 
and that's how he got into VSA like he has, uh, which is very, which I was lucky to fall, fall onto him, find him. But end of a rising market, that's the reason why it's weak. Now, the trouble with that is that fine, I always just short it, but sometimes, because the market is the way it behaves, right, if it's been supported <coughs> at various circumstances that occur during that phase of going sideways, if they can, they will mark it up. And, and very often that's an upthrust. I mean, don't get worried. We're, most of us get caught in these upthrusts occasionally. You did the other day. I got caught the other day. But, you know, it's easy in hindsight to decide what to do. If you short these end of rising market and start going sideways, just check a lower time frame and you'll see them what was more or less what they're up to. Thank you. Now the market opens soon, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah, Tom, Tom's uh, sitting here scanning for trades at the moment. Uh, he's just observed in five minutes the US market opens, so he'll be he's looking at his big chart here. Just to describe it to you, he's got a, I think it's a 60-inch monitor. He's got 20 price bars up. I will take a picture and send this to you so you can see what he looks at. He doesn't need to look at too much, and then he just tells me to uh, open up the trading dome and take a trade. And the other day when he traded, he got caught by an upthrust. His analysis was completely right. The market did fall. Uh, it fell quite dramatically. But he went short just before the upthrust, and, and it does happen. How many bars back do you look for weaknesses, Samir? And Brian says, why do you not count the spread from the close of the previous bar? I don't need, on an end of a rising market, I'm not interested in the previous bar at all, Brian. I'm only interested in that one bar, which tells me everything I need to know. Because it's the highest volume that we've seen, but it's the spread that gets me. It's, that's what, what, what I, I know I'm going to make money there, because it's got a narrow spread, close in the middle. But the next bar after it is important, not the one prior, the one after. Because after you see it, if the next bar closes level or lower, then you know, as Thomas said, that the sell orders are being put in by the smart money. The volume is high because they're selling to the buyers. And the buyers, who don't know any different, are buying an instrument that they think is going to go higher because everything infers it will. The news is good. Look, here it is. JP Morgan scores big in latest quarter. Banking giant enjoys rebound in key areas. So the news is good. The market gets gapped up. The volume is high. All the TV reporters will be saying, oh, we've seen volume surge today in JP Morgan as everyone buys. All the professionals are buying. But they're not buying at all. In fact, they're selling at a resistance level. This is back a year ago at almost the same price. And it happens all the time. So when you see the end of a rising market, the safest place to short is this rule here. Now, this is the rule we follow. We wait for the market to roll over. And I'm going to show you the chart in a minute. It's almost like a mushroom. A market mushrooms over. If you imagine a mushroom, when, when um, supply overcomes demand, the uptrend turns into a mushroom top and comes back down. Uh, Daniel says, what happens if the next bar is a no-demand bar? I'd go short then straight away, definitely. If you get no demand immediately after end of a rising market, then it's very likely going to fall almost immediately, Daniel. So you could short that, definitely. But I'm going to show you the safest place. Brian says, what's the difference between trading up to a level and gapping up? Well, the reason they gap markets is, is literally for, to excite the crowd. It's to excite the herd. Because you think about it, the news is good. Yeah, the market opens, there's a gap, so prices have gone up. The news tells everyone, the public, that JP Morgan's going to go to $100. And because of the gap in price and the high volume, most of the traders out there who don't understand volume think that because the price has gone up, the news is good, it must be buyers in control. But it's not. It's the complete opposite. Uh, are there any turns that Tom looks at that makes an upthrust more likely? You can't really say when an upthrust looks more likely. 
it's usually up for us to quite devious things. I've been, you know, if there's one time I get stopped out, it's usually up thrusts at market top. And it's usually because I've been a bit aggressive. You, you're probably better off waiting for the up thrust to appear and then going short. Because very rarely do you get uh, secondary up thrust. Usually the market just falls after the up thrust. Um, yeah, no, level or lower, Grigory. You want a level or a lower bar, okay, as I'll show you. So after you see the end of a rising market, the next day should close level or preferably lower. You don't really want to see a higher close, but lower for sure is the best. Absolutely. So here is where you short. Now, here is the actual chart. Now, this is where I went short. I actually shorted this stock. Okay. And I actually went short as the market went back up. I didn't short the end of a rising market. I waited four weeks. And so here, there's the end of the rising market. The market falls for several weeks, goes back up, and then there's a gotcha bar right there. And by the way, after the gotcha bar, which is that one there, which is in my book, you should all have read about that, widespread down, takes out all support. Once the market goes back up to the gotcha bar, you get a great entry. And by the way, that stock fell to $25. And here are two very very good entries to look for no demand and up thrust after you've got the end of a rising market now the end of a rising market in this case if you had have shorted it whoops if you had have shorted it you'd have made a lot of money down to here it went from 48 to 40 to the round number in about a week Now, I was trading a different stock, Lance. I wasn't trying. I mean, I tend to be patient with this stock because I know, well, I happen to know the specialist on the floor of the exchange that looks after this stock. And I happen to know where these signals are at their most optimum. And it's always, you'll always notice that the, uh, and you can go and read my book. It's in my book. Just read the book. I talk about this stock a great deal. And the end of a rising market comes at resistance levels, and it's so obvious to trade. It's so easy to trade it because you know what they're doing. It's amazing. Once you understand crowd behavior and the herd, and you understand what's going through the mind of the herd, you become a smart money trader yourself. Now, here is how Tom looks for shorting and, and staying in a trend. Now. Read that as I get Tom to explain the trending system. So now, Tom, we're going to talk about your simple trending system. Now, let's imagine we've gone short. So the market's falling. OK, so the market's coming down. Now, you said to me, well, Gavin, you stay in the trade while the market's going down. So you have a down bar, a down bar, a down bar. Now, if you get a level bar, you just ignore it. If you get two level bars, you just ignore them. Don't worry about them. Then you allow for two up bars as long as the volume is low on the up bars. And then you allow the market to fall further. If you get three up bars in a row, you probably want to close the trade. Just explain your trending system. <coughs> well, I mean, oh, it must have been uh, five, six years ago. I uh, decided we needed a trending system. So I sat here and put a lot of effort into developing a trending system, right? But sometimes when it worked, it worked brilliantly. But the big problem, of course, was the telling the computer how and when to switch from a downtrend to an uptrend or an uptrend to a downtrend. And when it worked, it was brilliant. But very often it didn't work, and I didn't like that. So I kind of forgot about it, to be quite honest, but it's still in the software, I believe. But I don't use that. But then I realize that simplicity is far, far better thing. Because I know for a fact that if, if um, a bullish move is taking place or going to, as each bar goes up, they, the, the professionals behind the move, or the, even the, the market makers or whoever, they make sure that the close of the bar is higher than the close of the previous bar, right? Because they, the biggest danger to a professional player 
is that if he's long and got money, huge, large amounts of money embedded in that uh, vehicle, whatever it is, right, the biggest danger is that um, other professionals will start selling into his up move because to mark the market up actually costs you money. So they don't want that. But they know that if they make sure that the close is higher than the close of previous bar, then you know that they're endeavoring to keep a bull move going. And in my software, I'm not sure what Gavin's color you've got, but mine are colored blue. Right, so the blue bars, that shows you. Because I've had many people in the past bring me up and say, Tom, yeah, I got in on the low there, look, but I sold out too soon. And it's very, very easy to get talk out of a trade far, far too easy. You talk yourself out of it. But if somebody else is telling you to as well, then it's very difficult for you to stay in there. But once you've got a good position in the market, and you could see that you've got in a nice position on the lows, right? All the time the bars are blue, it means that they're marking it up. Ignore any level bars, which my version of the program colors the bars black. Allow for one down bar. And usually that one down bar is on lowish volume. Because remember we were describing bullish and bearish volume the other day. Bullish volume is expanding volume on up bars while decreasing on down bars. And that's why if you allow for one down bar, the volume should be lower. That tells you that the market is still actually strong. Okay, and then you keep in the trade until some obvious sign of weakness appears, which will be on up bar. It'll be on very high volume or narrow spreads. Uh usually on some good news of some sort. So then it's a good a good place to close. That's if you're scalping the market like this. So that's the up move. Now, the down move is similar, right? Once you've shorted the market and you've got a position as the market's falling, right? The bar, my bars are colored uh, red, but I think Gavin's is green. No, I've actually put your trending system on these charts. I just showed it in the All right. All right. Right now, they're looking at a five-minute chart, the S&P, and the red bars. And yeah, the red, bar, bars. red bars. And, and black bars and level bars. Just That's that. right. So you ignore the level bars. Allow for, preferably, if you see one blue up bar and the volume is low, you can know definitely that market's weak because the market's trending down. They've attempted the market up and there's no demand. That's a sure sign of additional weakness to come. And uh, and they keep going with that trend, and that will keep you in the trend a lot, lot longer than you will normally stay in, because it's very, very easy to get psyched out of a trade, uh, either yourself uh, or other people over your shoulder or whatever. Very, very easy to get shaken out of a trade, only to regret it. And if you can't stay in the trade longer, that's a good guide for you to stay in. <coughs> okay, so um, yeah, Grigory, it should be you can allow. I mean, if if we look at a big trending market, let's look at the British pound because that was trending nicely. I'll put this. Let's have a quick look at the Aussie. Yeah, the Aussie. That's a good one to look at. OK, so it, it works best in bigger time frames, I have to say. I, I find it works best. But here you've got an example here of, of up bars and down bars. Down bars are red, up bars are blue, as you can see. And you can allow for two up bars. OK, you took the third up bar. You really want to start to be concerned. I mean, let's imagine you're short from this up thrust. OK, there's your first up bar. Don't worry about it. The second one is down. There's two up bars, but the second up bar is on low volume, so the market's still weak. The second up bar here is on low volume. It even gives you a signal. The market's still weak. The second up bar here is on an increase in volume, but the third bar never, ever goes higher. Down bar, down bar. Two up bars stay short. Down bar, down bar, up bar. Down bar, level bar, ignore it. I can allow two up bars. I don't even need to. 
down bar, up bar, down bar. There's two up bars. You're still short. Bang. Now you're in profit. Up bar, down bar, down bar, etc., etc. Down the move. And that is how it works. And if, you, if you've got Trade Guider, you can color these bars any color you like. But Tom uses blue, black, and red to determine an up bar, a down bar, or a level bar. We can ignore the level bars. And notice, even now on that trending system, you would still be short. And indeed, here, we just got a signal that supply is coming into the market in this downtrend. So really, I should probably, that's the Aussie dollar, I should probably look to try and take a short trade here. In fact, let's probably let's get, have a quick look over here and see where we're at. And that looks weak at this moment in time because the trending system is telling us very clearly that the market is downtrending. So I want to trade any position to the downside, especially if I get an up thrust or anything like that. And look, my trend cluster is right over the top of me. So this, you know, and again, you could see there, how many up bars do you have? That's the only time in this trend where you probably would have been stopped out when you got four up bars in a row. Right there. But since then, we've had two up bars, down bar, up bar, up bar. We've had three down bars. And then the next up bar produces a sign of weakness. And I would not be surprised to see this turn into an up thrust. And if that is the case, in a downtrending market, that's where my stop goes at 1.03. I've got a 15 tick stop. And I'm looking for a profit target of around 55. So 30 tick move. And if I go to a smaller time frame, I'll see if I can get an entry. And you can see that it's already setting up. You see here, they've tested that level. Mm, it's nothing obvious yet. I wouldn't yet be short here. I'd have to wait. It's very choppy in here, but it's definitely trying to do something. No setup yet. But nevertheless, a good example of the trending system. So here, very good example of how you stay in a trend. There's simple colors in the software that help you to do that. But basically, we're looking, as you can see there, at bars A, B, G, and H. We see the market going up, but on decreasing volume. We note that price is trending down. And at bars C, D, E, and F, we have increasing volume and up bars. However, we allow two bars. And at bar F, the price closes lower than bar E, so we let the trade run. Had bar F closed as an up bar, we would have closed our short trade. And this is a simple way of doing it. We're just allowing the trade to run. Most retail traders get out the market far too quickly. Here's another example. You've got weakness and distribution in the yellow area at points A and B. So you've got your selling happening between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on this British pound forex chart. The market moves sideways for around 20 bars, which it often does. I always look closely at the narrow spreads of these bars. If the market's trying to make upward progress and the spreads are narrowing, it means that there's sell orders capping the market. And after this weakness, you expect a decline. And that's exactly what happened. And at bar C, you clearly see a gotcha bar takes out all support and the bar behind it. And at bar D, that's the place to short. It's no demand there. And it's confirmed by the very next bar. This is how you trade. You look for the Yao Ming bars. You look for the change in behavior. You look for no demand. So what is no demand? OK. Markets are constantly. Now, why have just typed in a question? What time frame? Depends what time frame you're trading, YF. Doesn't matter. I, I, this is this is this confuses people, Tom. And I'll get you to ask this question. YF says, "Well, what time frame?" And everyone seems to be pigeonholed into, "Well, should I use a weekly, a daily, a one minute?" But your principles work on a one minute chart, and they work on a fifteen minute chart. So, what time frames do you recommend people use, or should they just find their own ones? Well. That's all that's it. You find your own trend or trends, um, your, your own time frames. I personally um, like to, I usually like to look at the daily chart first, get some idea the road it's on, roughly where it's going. Okay, very often 
but not always. There's indications on the daily chart that make it very, very clear if that market is going to go up or down in the next bar or so. And then, usually, uh, but all the time frames are interesting. I often look then at the hour, and then perhaps uh, a 15-minute chart. I mean, when I first started programming, and I was instructing the programmer, he said, you can't expect these things to work and all these the same on all these different time frames. It's impossible, he said, and this is a, a clever programmer. So they, they don't know everything. I said, well, it may be so, but you check it out and look at it. And he was quite surprised when he saw the signals that were just one signal worked on almost any of these time frames. Didn't necessarily come up on every time frame. That's why you need to check through the different time frames. I mean, right now I'm looking at the S&P 500, the opening. It looks like a horrific uh, up thrust bar. It doesn't look healthy at all, at all. Uh, they do that because they were enabled to mark it up like that to collapse on the low. Or oh, it's a level bar, it's black, it's a huge black bar. And we've got a signal of weakness appear on it, well, a yellow box at the top. And But the reason it was allowed to do that, there was actually a side of strength came in. But then I thought, well, I don't know. There's so much weakness in the background. Is this uh, uh, indication going up? But look at that. See that, Gav? I'm, I'm already trading, yeah. Yeah, yeah this, this, this is a perfect example. Yeah. I mean, look at that. That looks horrific, doesn't it? That's a definite sign of weakness. Well, so it looks like. And we've got all this weakness in the background. So I said to Gavin, I said, don't forget last Friday. I mean, horrific sign of weakness. And I think we said at the time, when you see these widespreads down, close on the low with a slight increase in volume, that's not low or not excessive, probably just above the average a bit, right? As it rushes towards a former area of support, which could be the uh, last support, it could be a trend line, it's normally a built-in sign of weakness, although you may get a bouncing effect where it may bounce up. Uh, for a bar or two, but um, I said to Gavin, don't forget you got that last Friday. So that's hovering in the background. The right moment, you certainly wouldn't go long at all. You're not interested in the upside at the moment, but we're, we're watching it. Yeah, so he, here is a, uh, a trade setup, and, and you can see it live now. Let's go to a live chart. Now, we notice in the background... We've got a gotcha bar here, look, widespread down, increase in volume here. And the market has failed to go through it once, twice, didn't even get anywhere near there. And it's gone right up to it here and right up to it again. So the question we've got to ask ourselves, what is the chances the market's going to push through and penetrate that? So in this instance, you could get upthrusted. There's a possibility there, but that's a very weak bar. So we now look to see what the next bar does. OK, which has got another 13 minutes to confirm it. If it closes lower than the close of this bar, then we're going to expect falling prices. And then what we're going to do is actually have a look to see if there's a setup that we can take. Now, at the moment, it's been in this choppy range. But we look at the observation of what price did here. It fell. And we measure how many bars of movement we had over a period of three hours. So the high of the bar there was 288 and it went to a low of 271 so it went down about 16 ticks so if we have the same sort of range of movement and we come back down to this low here I can measure off my risk by putting a stop just above here and look at where my reward could be and the reward the initial reward here with two or three contracts could actually be quite nice if it comes down that level so my risk on the trade would be fairly negligible because I've got stop just above the top here. But the reward could be anything from 15 to 20 ticks. So we'll look at this. We'll keep an eye on this now. We'll watch this and see where it, where it actually goes. But let me now talk about no demand at market top. Okay, so we're actually seeing some live principles appear 
at these levels. Notice how this red line, which is my trigger number, has come up here. And um, is this a weak bar at the moment? At the moment, yes. But I want the next bar to close around 275. Okay, and that will confirm that weakness. And I'd like to see an increase in volume as the, the bar comes down. And then what we'll see is if it then pushes down further to this level, and when it gets to that level, we can look at the trade and say, if it comes down here, is it weak or strong? Now, we're in a trading range here. Look, we've got a definite support level here. We can see there and there. So, and we've got a definite resistance level. One, two, and we've got a signal on this last resistance level. So if they mark it down here to this level, I know that there's a good trade to the downside, and then I'm going to go to a smaller time frame to see if I get any setups. So we can put a line and define where I think the market's going. I'll make that a green line because it's where support is. So I can define where I think the market can go, and I can also define where the market has got a resistance level because it's got resistance here, 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 and now here it's rejected price. Look at the effort versus result. That doesn't mean they can't push it up. But what I see on that last bar, as this is at right at the right edge of the chart, is an effort to rise followed by a result to the downside, i.e. a closing price on the lower the bar. But the next bar will determine where we're likely to go here. The next bar. Because we've had three up bars in the last hour but if that is genuine weakness that bar will close lower terry says what with trigger numbers what determines whether you mark the high low or close i often mark all of them terry but in this instance i've used the closing price of this bar here but any of these bars see well, all i'm interested in is when i've got price action at the right edge that's close to action to the left I look at the bar that makes the most sense. And if I look at the closing price of that bar, I can see that price was rejected once, twice, three times, four, five, and here's the sixth time. Now, it may go up, but if it's rejected and it closes lower, I've got a very nice trade down there to 1.026, which is a round number as well. So, we, you know, look at where the round number is. 1.0200 is below me, not above me. Markets seem to get drawn to round numbers. So what I'm looking for is uh, to take out the low of this bar. That's the first thing. So this price to push below it and then come back down to this initial level at 271, which is 10 ticks. OK, and then when I get there, look at the volume, see what it tells me, see what the market's doing. So no demand at the top of a market. Now this signal was the signal I used to trade oil in 2008 and I remember speaking to Tom about it and I remember the market had been very bullish for a long time and oil was going to $200 a barrel apparently but then what happened? Suddenly we saw no demand at the market top. There was no volume on the weekly chart. And this signal works much better, I think, in bigger time frames. Because the trend of price will be up, as it always is. And then the market appears to run out of energy. So, Tom, no demand at market top. Explain the principle. Well, when it's explained, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, in the background, you've seen... Weakness appear, like end of rising market or supply overcoming demand. After you've seen a bullish up move, remember that, makes the market vulnerable, so weakness comes in, right? And then they very often have to hold the market up. In a stock, they inevitably have to. So it takes time to sell more on every little wave that arrives. They mark it up and they sell more into those little waves up okay so do that they have to hold the market up now if they can't generate a nice up thrust to uh catch 
Remember, above and below these markets, actively traded markets, there are not hundreds but thousands of stocks. And it pays. Now, Gavin just said they seem to be attracted to uh, zero numbers. Is it own numbers, you said? Yeah, round numbers. Round numbers. And, of course, the reason for that is one of the reasons, I should say, uh, is that, of course, the general public or the herd think in, in round numbers. They think, oh, yes, well, if you go to an auction, you think, oh, yes, I'll bid to $50 for that. I'll bid to $80 for that. I'll bid to $100 for that. You don't say, oh, I'll bid $112 for that. Normally, you don't. Well, professionals know that the, the, the people, the weak holders, are potential weak holders, or the public, they think on those round numbers. And that's why they become important. And that's what they, they often have that in mind. And somebody said they, they know where your stops are because they have them marked on the screen, most of them. They have a special screen service that does that. But if you see that a weakness has appeared, and the market moves up, right, and you note that the volume is low, and the computer will color it pink for you, show it, relatively speaking, it's low relative to the two previous bars. That means there's no demand. And there's nothing unusual about that. I describe it like an auction room. You go to an auction room, and the auctioneer's job to get as much as he can for the item on sale. So if the item's worth $100, you'll say, right, right, now, who, $200, who's going to bid $200? And he looks at in a very optimistic way. Now, if the room is full of uh, people who know what they're doing, there will be no response because they know it's been marked up, right? There is no demand. It's been marked up. It's not the correct price. And that's what no demand is, roughly. And whenever you see that and there's weakness in the background, you can rest assured it's a very good time to short the market. You certainly don't want to be long at a time like that. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Um, going to say if the next bar will be no demand, would you go to the trade at that point? Um, just going back here, uh, yeah, if that was no demand at that level, absolutely. But what I'm looking for here on this bar is it's closed below the 50% line. I'm, the, I'm more interested in this next bar as to where it closes. If it closes on the low, that will confirm my suspicion that supply is overcoming demand here. And if the spread stays narrow, something's squashing price action. And that will be a very nice little trade. Now, again, you wouldn't want to get in on it until you look at the smaller time frame to see if you've got weakness on the smaller time frame. And again here, we can see there is... You've got very narrow spreads on the bars. That's a good sign. Look at the, the way the spreads are narrowing. That's always a good sign. If they're narrowed up like that, something's capping the price. So we're then looking for a push down to back to this level. So it's a very choppy market here, but you've got weakness there. There's no doubt about that. Um, and we're just looking for evidence on the 15-minute chart that that is weakness. If we have no demand on this bar at this level, that would be of interest too. So we can see the chart telling us a story. There's a lot. It, has it been artificially marked up at the open? And if it has, we've got to look to see where it's likely to go. And if we get no demand up here, then yeah, that would be that would be confirming the weakness. Okay. So here we see no demand at the top, and it happens often. You'll get this where it repeats itself, and it comes up and the volume is less than the previous two bar. This is another example here of Apple on the weekly chart. Weekly chart of Apple. Market goes up. Look at the volume. It goes up on no demand. Always see, this is the confusing bit to some people. They say, well, Gavin, now I'm going to ask Tom about this one because I know it does confuse some of you. You say, well, hold on a second. You said to us that weakness appears on very high volume up bars. And then you've said weakness appears on low volume up bars. Now, which one is it? You can't be both, but it is. And it is actually the reason 
that some people find VSA initially difficult to concept to, to get the concept right because they say, well, you've contradicted yourself, Gavin. You've told us that ultra high volume on up bars is weakness, and now you've said if the market goes up on low volume on an up bar, it's weakness. But both are true. It's Tom. Well, it's it has to be true when you understand the market and you understand you've got the so-called smart money in the background working against you. Um, obviously, so the first um, initial move up is when you see the volume ultra high, right? Especially if it closes in the middle and you've got some sort of up move behind you. Uh, it usually is supply overcoming demand. And that's a sign of weakness. And, of course, when you get to the end of a rising market, it's pretty obvious it's, it's definitely weakness, especially if it's up there in fresh high ground. However, on saying that, sometimes they mark the market up deliberately, like the auctioneer, try to squeeze some trades out of people out there. And so they mark it up artificially, right? And, uh, of course, it is an artificial markup. There's not the volume there to back it up and that you see that come up as no low volume and that if that happens after you see the sign of weakness you can be rest assured that it's a serious sign of weakness so um, once you understand the logic it's very easy but don't get don't listen to other people because they don't understand it Yep, thanks, Tom. And, and again, you see this happening all the time. No demand at market tops. Again, another example of Apple here. You can see what happened to the price. You know, see the way it immediately collapsed. You often find after these, and they work very well on weekly charts as well. You often find that you get a serious sign of weakness appear, as it does here, and then the market falls. And Apple dropped. This was a long time ago this, this chart was taken, but it's a great example. It really is. Great example. And here's another one. This is a UK stock. And, and, and always look to find resistance levels to the left as well. These no demand bars work very good when there's prior resistance to higher prices. I mean, let's just go and have a look at the live chart for a second and see if there's anything there. So what have we got here? Yeah, well, they're whipsawing it now, Tom's saying. Well, they are. Yeah, they're definitely whipsawing. This is the three-minute chart. You can see uh, it's, uh, again, if we look at the uh, where the price is doing, it's gradually trying to go up to this area. It's like a, it's like a mini test, if you like, an opposing test. But we're going to look at the spread of the bar. We're going to look at the closing price. And then on the 15-minute chart, we're going to see what they're trying to do here. Is that going to end up in 15 minutes' time as a no-demand bar? We don't know. Is it going to be an upthrust? We have to wait and see. We have to be patient. And that's, that's really what the game of trading uh, is all about. So no demand at market top will happen when you get to resistance lines. So keep that in mind, okay? You're looking for resistance levels. Don't just trade these no demand bars anywhere. Wait for them at resistance or when the market's falling. No demand works best in a falling, weak market after you've seen some sort of uh, serious sign of weakness. And a serious sign of weakness is basically when the market rolls over. So you see an end of a rising market or an upthrust or something of that magnitude on ultra high volume, and the market rolls over. Now, remember, we're looking for that mushroom shape, as I'll show you. Let's just have a look at that chart here. It's pushing through that resistance line. Yep, yeah, so that's interesting. So it's pushing up through it. Again, we're going to keep an eye on the volume here and see what it does at that level if it's actually going to try and push through. Good. So do not go short on a no demand bar if there's an uptrend still in place. Now, that can be a problem for some of you if you're trying to short these at a market top because at a market top, there will be an uptrend behind you. All right, and that's, that's one of the problems that you have. There will be an uptrend behind you. So be patient. These bars are far more powerful places to short when you've suddenly seen a serious sign of weakness 
in the background. And I mean within about 25 bars behind you. And a serious sign of weakness is a buying climax or the end of a rising market. We'll come to the buying climax uh, later on. But those are what we call serious signs of weakness. So no demand bars are far more powerful and will, and will give you much better trades when you have seen something like the end of a rising market or you've seen a buying climax, which will be both of those signals will be on ultra high volume. So principle three, OK, is no result from effort. Now, the market moves on three universal laws which is the law of supply and demand, cause and effect, effort versus result. So if the market's going to move up, the serious signs of weakness, William, is a buying climax and the end of a rising market. They are what we would determine as major signs of weakness. You want to be looking out for those if you see them. They are major signs of weakness. They are meaning the market's really very, very weak at that point, and so you want to look out for them. So no result from effort is a little bit like an upthrust. If you see any indication of strength in an uptrend, you would expect to see a strong market follow. But if you see a big widespread down bar closing on the lows, and the low and the close is lower than the previous bar, we call this a countermanding signal. It means the market's weak at that time. You do not fight the market that you have to assume there's been no result in an effort to rise. Therefore, the market must be weak at that time. If the original indication was genuine sign of strength, then professional money would immediately move into the market and you'd get higher prices, not lower. So no result from effort is one of Tom's signals. Tom, explain to us no result from effort. <coughs> Right, what if there is an effort to do something in life or your life or you see somebody make an effort to do something? If there's no result from that effort, then it's a sign of weakness as far as you're concerned, the observer. And uh, we, the, the most obvious one is, is you sometimes, well, when you see a weak market, you may see an ever rising market and you may actually see a test appear, what looks like a test. Right, and uh, but if that there's not an immediate up move from that test, then we call that a fail test. So the effort, there's no result. It's actually a, a sign of weakness built in there. And uh, uh, the markets, uh, they also work on that effort versus result. But you'll get your head around it. Um, when I first started, it took me two years to figure out or have some idea what was going on or what they were looking at. Of course, I didn't have anybody actually teaching me, although I did take the, the Wyckoff course. But be quite honest, I wouldn't recommend the Wyckoff course now because it's too old-fashioned. Yeah, we are actually redesigning and rebuilding the, uh, the Wyckoff course, funny enough, uh, for that reason. Um, yeah, so again, what have we seen on this uh, this Aussie chart? The high volume's coming in. It's pushed through now this level. We've got to see where it closes, haven't we? We've got to look. And um, someone said, look at the British pound. Well, I'll look at the 15-minute pound chart here. Yeah, it, well, the pound actually is coming down, which is quite interesting. So, so the Aussie dollar's popped up. The pound is actually trying to fall. And we'll have to look at this live chart of the S&P. The S&P's trying to rally. And we'll also look at gold quickly. And just as the market's open, it's nice to go and see if we can see some actual principles actually appearing. OK, and there's gold. It's up at 17. Well, there's a nice spike of, of volume on the gold chart there. So we see gold has been spiked. The S&P spiked. And now we've got a very interesting scenario with gold, look. Because again, what we've got, is you've got a resistance line above us, and it's hit the resistance. The volume is very high. So really now, we look for a change in behavior there and look for gold and see what happens and see what gold actually does. But at the moment, there's a lot of activity going on, no real result. So when we look at effort versus result, we're looking at the individual bar. 
Here's another good example. You see at bar eight, they do this a lot. They mark the price up to encourage longs. And then at bar B, the volume is high, but look at where it closes. And it's all about bar C because we're looking where the closing price is. If the price closes lower than the effort versus result bar at bar C that we can see here, then it means there must be more sellers than buyers in control at bar A and B. So effort versus result is very powerful, and it happens in all time frames. Uh, which is a stronger indication of price direction, the S&P or the ES futures? Uh, I, look, I look at the futures, actually. I look at the futures market. Um, yeah, the E-mini S&P TP, that's what I actually trade. And you usually get a very clear indication of what's going on there when you look at the E-mini S&P. The futures does not move before the cash, although people think it does. It doesn't actually do that which is quite interesting when you think about the logic behind that. Um, I've, I've been asked that question many times. Does the cash move the future? And um, you'll find that they're both arbitrage. You've got traders trading the cash market and the futures market. But anyway, going on to this chart, effort versus result. Always look at what the price bar is telling you. This will usually appear in an uptrend. But it's a far more powerful short in a downtrend. Do not short this in an uptrend. If the market's weak, it will roll over, and then you'll see further signs of weakness appearing. This is a powerful short when there is a downtrend in place. Now, this is where I short these, and they're great trades to take. Okay, so let me just bring in uh, Lance, who's using his microphone. Okay, yeah, hey, Lance, I've got you. I uh, just saw you said you've got a question. Yeah, thanks. Gavin, um, that fella that's just um, asked a question regarding like um, whatever determines the price action. I, f I, f I feel that's a, a really important question for the sort of stage of trading that I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, can we just go into that a bit more deeply uh, regarding what, what markets may be sort of, I know there's massive amounts of um, stocks and whatnot, but re regarding the correlation and what you, you and Tom look for first thing in the morning. What charts have you got open? Mm -hmm. um, also, bearing in mind, you know, I, I'm in the UK. I'm not from all around the Australia and Malaysia and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I like to trade the gold. Now, you know, if the dollar goes up, gold comes down, um, which is pretty standard um, sort of stuff. Not always. Um, not not always. Not recently. No, I mean. Yeah, no, don't, don't make that assumption, though, because there are times when markets should correlate, and they don't, and that means something's setting up. So you've got to be very careful. It's a great question. Very yeah, I was careful broadly to, speaking, yeah. most people, even before I, even before I, I knew anything about um, VSA or any, anything about the trading of the markets, I was always sub subconsciously, if somebody was to have stopped me in the street and said, what happens if gold goes, if gold goes up, what happens, what does, what's the likelihood of got, um, the dollar? And I said, well, it's probably lost value. You know, it's, so uh, when I say that, I mean, in a broad sense of people who don't trade the markets would automatically, I ass assume that's what happens. Mm -hmm. and nine times out of ten, they would be correct. Um, but things like the S&P, you know, we've got Apple, um, I, I believe, make up a large chunk of the S&P. So if Apple's doing well, mm -hmm. the S&P is doing well as a whole. Um, I mean, what is, what's the... How do I explain it? It's hard. It's difficult. What's the Fox's company? You know, what makes that go up? Or if a stock in the Fox's is going up, why does it hold the Fox's up? I'm not being very clear. No, I think I, no, no. I think you are actually. I think you're being very clear. Actually, I understand your question. What I think you're asking me here is what is causing the markets to go up and down. And of course, if we look at the indexes, let's start with that. Every um, country around the world, uh, or most countries, have an index, all right? and they're made up yeah. of, of different stuff. Like you, you've heard of the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250, you've heard of the S&P 500, which are the 500 stocks, and what happens is the exchanges, or the club of the insiders, decide which stocks are going to make up the indexes, okay? That's in simple terms. And so they decide which stocks are going to make up the S&P 500, which is why some stocks come into the index and some fall foul and leave the index. But in general terms, 
It's supposed to be the top, if we talk about the S&P 500, which is well known, the top 500 stocks um, in the United States that trade on that exchange. Now, the S&P 500 is the Standard & Poor's 500 stocks, and you can trade the cash market, or you can trade the futures market of that of that particular index. Now, most traders that I know trade the futures market, which is called the E-mini S&P. And the E-mini S&P is the same as all the others, the E-mini NASDAQ, the E-mini Dow. There's a, there's a mini FTSE because it's easier to trade and you don't need so much cash or, or account size to trade the, these markets. You can get a lot of leverage through your brokers, which is why most retail traders are trading the e-mini. You'll hear that a lot, the e-mini uh, futures markets. Now, what causes the price to move is probably what your question is. What is going on? No, Why no, 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 no. I, I'm not really that fussed about that. <laughs> okay. Um, let, uh, this might be a better way for me to try and explain. Let's take Caterpillar. Yep. That's traded on the American market and in the UK, isn't it? Yep. It's traded on two right. exchanges, yep. So it's BP, okay. yep. Would, yeah, it might be, if Caterpillar on the American market was rallying up, would that mean in the UK market it would also be rallying up? Or could the one in the UK be coming down? Or is M Most of the time, you're going to see a company traded in the same direction in both exchanges. Like, for instance, BHP Billiton is traded on the US exchange and the Australian exchange, and generally speaking, it moves in the same way. But it doesn't mean it has to, because remember, the markets are being manipulated at all times. So you might well see the Australian BHP move up and a markdown in the, in the uh, stock in America. There's no rule for that. There's no set rule for that. Yeah. So, so what I tend to do, and I mean, t Tom summed it up for me nicely. When I started to learn to trade, I had all the questions that you've got. Why? Why? What about this? Why does this do that? Who are the smart money? What is this? And Tom said, Gavin, it doesn't matter. It, you, don't no, need to, you don't need to know why. You need to read the principles and trade them. You don't need to know who is so behind are, are, are you saying to me then that when you and Tom get down to business, right, yeah. mm -hmm. and you, what, let's say you're trading the, the gold futures, yeah. mm -hmm. you, you're getting down to business, you have not... You haven't got your gold, I mean, sorry, your currency chart up for dollar. You're not interested in it. You just, if you woke up, you thought, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trade the gold because you I, think there's a movement going. I, I, will tell, about your currency. I, will, I will explain to you that when I set Tom's charts up, he doesn't care if the dollar's going up and gold's going up or if the dollar's going down and gold's going up. It's, it's irrelevant. All Tom is looking for is the principle of volume spread analysis. That's it. He keeps it very simple. And let me bring him in, Lance, because that's a great... So this is, this is Lance, who's one of our new customers. Yeah, you know, I know we're going to speak to Lance separately, but great question here. Because I get asked this a lot. It's the why is the wherefores? Why is the market doing this? Why? You know, when we look at charts, we keep it very simple. We really do. And I think people think that you and I have got some sort of secret that we're looking at different charts behind the scenes. But actually... We switch on your computer, you say, show me a chart. Is there a principle? No. Show me another chart. Is there a principle? No. Show me another chart. There it is, Gavin. There's the upthrust. Let's get ready to go short. And it really is quite as simple as that. Do you want to explain how your thought process works? Lance, here's Tom. Uh, I don't think he can hear you very well. But anyway, he, he, your mic's open, Lance, just so you know. And here's Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Lance. Hi, Tom. Hi. Okay. So... Yeah, well, I mean, I, I said to Gavin, can I just can I just say, when you and Gavin get down to business, and I'm a, we're we're using the scenario of um, the gold futures, you want to trade the gold futures. Yes. Are you really not bothered about them currencies? You just look at your gold futures and you read it from that. You're not interested at all when you're getting down to business with currency. I can't hear you all that well, but Gavin. Ask. Yeah, sorry, Lance. He hasn't got his hearing aid in, so you'll have to repeat it to me. Oh, right. Oh, right, yeah, okay, no. I'll listen to him then. Yeah, have a listen to Tom, because I'm going to just repeat your question. So, when, we, when you're setting up your charts in the morning, it's a good question, all right? Now, are you looking at all the correlation between the S&P, the FTSE, the DAX? Are you looking at silver and gold are looking weak? Should I be buying stocks? Or are you just looking at the charts and the principles? No, that's right. All I'm looking at is the chart and the principle. That's all I'm really interested in. 
because it's no point in being too clever or trying to be too smart because you'll never know the answers anyway. Um, I mean, even Peter here the other week said, oh, well, the volume's low because they're all at lunch. I said, well, don't complicate things. It may or may not be a lunch. But believe me, the professional money never, never sleep. They'll have an idea what's going on. So it's not a good idea to try to be too clever and try to look at this and look at that and wonder why and, and all those. We don't ask questions of why and, and, and where, where everything is. All you want to do is know the principles work, right, and then spot them. And that's all you really need to know. Because you'll never know the true answer, even if you had a direct line to some of the top traders on the floor in the New York Stock Exchange, they probably lie to you anyway. They can't be bothered to tell you anything. So don't try to be too smart. Yeah, and let me let me just add to that, um, Lance. One of the things that we do when we when we're setting up our trades. Um, and, and actually, just so you know, Lance, you can't see it, but all the people are typing in here. Many of them, great question from you, and that you're you're asking the questions that they wanted to ask. When we look for trades, okay, it's not complicated to do, right? Now, when I start my day, and we'll do this Friday, the first thing I do is bring up the scanner, okay? Now, you should be able to see the scanner here. Can you see that, Lance, on your yeah. screen? Right. Now, you'll see here I've got commodities, stocks, currency futures, foreign exchange, futures, and then there's UK stocks and stuff. So I'm following, and there's the futures of the ICE exchange, which is another exchange in America. Now, all of these instruments trade on exchanges, okay, except for spot forex, which doesn't trade on an exchange. It's, uh, it's, um, I don't really trade the spot forex anymore. I trade the currency futures market. Um, but I look at all of these instruments to find out if there's any unusual volume. And if I see very unusual volume, like in the Russell here, this is the Russell, you've got SB is sugar, KC is coffee, you've got all these different markets, I can go to here, E-mini is, uh, the E-mini S&P is ES, all of these produce unusual volume activity at some point. Now here, to my left, is what we call the VSA scanner. And the way Tom and I use that is we look for three things to determine what's going on in the market. Number one, we look for unusually high volume. And of course, most of the time, during the trading day, at the beginning of the day, especially when the American market opens and the UK market opens, you get high volume. Why? Because the professional traders are at work. So we want to see what they're up to. The second thing we're going to look for is the trend of price. Are the diamonds red or green or mixed? Well, I can see at the moment that on my hourly chart of the E-mini futures contract, the diamonds are mostly red. So I'm in a downtrend. On the 15-minute chart, the diamonds are mostly red. I'm in a downtrend. The 10-minute chart, the diamonds are mostly red. I'm in a downtrend. Same here and here. So now I'm going to look for any signals on the 5-minute chart that might give me an opportunity to short the market. So we put up the 5-minute chart here. Remember, we're in a bigger term downtrend. And then the next thing I'm going to look at, is there a resistance level to the left of me where price has refused to go through it? Yeah, overnight there was. There it is. So then I'm going to say to myself, hey, is there an opportunity to short the market at that level if I get a principal appear? And the answer, and I'm not worried about gold or silver at this point. I'm focusing on this one chart because that's where I'm going to make my money. And here... The market has come up to that level. It's rejected it once. You can see it actually right at the, the, the line I've drawn, the trigger number, we've had a rejection of price at that level, okay? And the market fell about three points. And now it's whipsawing, which is what they do in the first hour. They try and get everybody out the market. All the retail traders in here that have got a two-tick stop because they think they're clever are getting their backsides handed to them on a plate right now. But eventually, there will be a determination of trend. There will be a trend formed. Sometimes, there's no trend for the day. It just goes sideways, which case I don't bother trading it. And I look for another chart that's given me a better opportunity. Mondays are not always the greatest day to trade because they test the market on a Monday 
ready for a bigger move. But the other thing I'll do, and I'll do this on, I mean, we've sort of jumped the gun a little bit here, but it's no problem. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. No, it's, I'm glad you asked, because I know people have, have been thinking the same thing. On Friday, when we do the live trading session, Tom and I will do exactly what we do when we trade together. We'll go through all the charts and we'll find the trades that make sense. And the only I mean, tr trade that makes sense to me at this moment in time is the currencies. I like I specialize in the currency futures contract. Now, this here is the, the currencies. And I can see a few things that are setting up. The pound here, the British pound, has been in a nice corrective move, which we can see. And if I go to the five-minute time frame, just 15 minutes ago, I was going to trade this, but I was talking to Tom, I saw a potential short trade on that bar there because it was confirmed on the next bar. And actually, as I was talking to you all, I saw this fall. And now I've got another opportunity here to say, yeah, this is trying to move down. The reason I like this chart, it's taken out this support level to the left. And I've got a serious sign of weakness here. Look at the spread of the bar. And it's in a trend cluster, which is a resistance line. And the four-hour chart and the other charts around it are trending down. So you can see, therefore, that that would make sense to look for short trades in that market. And so all we're doing is scanning the markets. And again, you can trade anything. I mean, someone said to me, Gavin, what is the best market to trade? And the answer is the one that's going to make you money on the day you're trading it. There's yeah. no I notice you've got a hell of a lot of um, information in Trade Guider with like your different times, your different stocks, your futures, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've got on my within my e-signal, I've got a quote window, and mm -hmm. all of my um, in I think their instruments, um, what I tr what I would potentially be trading, are in e-signal. Now, it seems an awful lot of hassle to type them in individually. What any ideas of how I can get my quote window? into trade guider without manually no, no, yeah Lance that's a question for AJ in support not for a, a mentorship course but yeah I'll get him to talk to you separately and I'll show you. in a mentorship course so your question your original question was brilliant when it comes down to individually setting up eSignal that's a, a tech support thing I'll get AJ to help you there but eSignal do not have this we, we don't they have, don't have this built in no. this is only built into the, the trade guider program but let me show you set up now now there's one coming right now right so I've been watching this for a while and it's coming right now. So you can see exactly how I'm thinking. I'm short. I'm ready to short the Aussie dollar. Okay. Now, why? Let's look at this chart. Okay. And I'm going to go away because we're going to look at a live chart now and not a chart of historical data. And we're going to see this bar here, which is one of Tom's favorites. Now, this is a buying climax. And the market, I should have shorted on that bar, but I'm busy talking. But now we're going to look for no demand. So, Tom. On a five-minute chart of the Aussie dollar, I'm going to show Tom this chart now. So you see, this tends to happen. We tend to get lucky with these live charts where we get principles come in just as you've asked the question. So we, we're quite lucky with that. So, Tom, we've got Lance on here, and we've got a whole group of people listening in. Your signal just came in. Highest volume that we've seen on the Aussie dollar on the five-minute chart for about 10 hours. Effort. Yeah, and I'll put, I'm going to put the chart up so you can all see this. Sorry if we've broken away from the PowerPoint here, but I think this is a better way to learn this stuff is to see it actually happening. So you've got massive volume here. Next bar closes lower, which is what I was looking for. And now we're looking for some sort of no demand to come in. Yeah, it, yeah there's a little bit of no demand on that bar. Do you want to explain what's going on here, Tom, on this five-minute chart? Lance, your mic is still open, just so you know, but Tom can't hear you, so you may just want to have a quick listen. Okay. Well, the Aussie dollar has uh, always been fairly good for trading. And uh, we've seen that move. Look, we've got that move behind us. We've seen one or two signs of weakness in the chart, in the background. But where the cursor is now, are you showing that? Yep. That up bar there, look, it's pretty obvious, look. The volume is massive, ultra high, and... It stuck its head up into fresh high ground. Remember I said about the end of a rising market one? And that bar is, is the spread is fairly narrow, but it's close in the middle of, so it's definitely signs of weakness on that bar. Now, as the market falls, these red bars, 
as soon as you see a blue up bar on low volume, you can short it. And there's one right there, look. Okay, it could be a bit lower, I suppose. But there. That would be your indication of shorting. But that's weakness, look. And, and you also look at the bigger trend, Tom. If we yeah. go to the hourly chart, they can see we're in a downtrend. If you could just tell them, you can see the downtrend on the hourly. Right, Gavin says there's a downtrend on the hourly chart. Yeah. Well, Gavin, if you was trading that, you'd want to take out those hold two... On, right, Hang on. Hold on, yeah. Yeah, hold on, lads. Yeah, Tom, Tom can't hear you. So, yeah, you can see there, look, if you look at this chart uh, as we're looking at it here, there's your downtrend on the hourly, okay? So for the last three days, we've been trending down. You agree with that, Lance? Yeah, man. Yeah, okay, yeah. and then here, we've got a spike up, but look at the resistance to price at that level. It's bounced off. It's bounced off. There was an up thrust. Now, this could well be an up thrust. We don't know yet. We'll have to wait and see. But if the five-minute chart now turns over and we get what I call a no demand, so we actually have... A blue bar is an up bar. We've got one down bar, one down bar, allow for one up bar. This bar closes lower than that bar, okay, or level. It may close level. I don't know. If it closes level, I can disregard it. And if the next bar closes lower, and we take out there, it's level bar. See, it's closed black. So the closing price is at 286, and the closing price is exactly the same on that bar. Now, this next bar needs to close lower. It needs to close below here, and then that's a trade setup. Then I'm looking for the market to move down and go back up on no demand. So no volume on the up move. And with that in the background, I'll get a trade probably down to here. So I need to see a, 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 a change in behavior. At the moment, the market's moved sideways a bit. But with that bar here in the background, which has moved the price down, and with the market here failing to respond positively, as the volume came in here and here, look at where the price closed on those two bars, Lance. It closed near the lower of the bar, mm. and the next bars closed level. We would expect lower prices here. Okay? I've got you loud and clear. Yep. Great stuff, mate. Good questions, by the way. Thanks. It's good, good, good questions. All right, everyone. Let me just mute my uh, Lance for a second there. And let's, um, we've, we're sort of overrunning a bit here, but I'm going to go another uh, 15, 20 minutes because I think we've got, some stuff we want to talk about, which is my favorite signal. Um, the end of a rising market is the favorite, followed by this one, the up thrust. Now, uh, Tom has taught a lady to trade here in England called Rita Offen. Now, Rita is uh, a contributor to the VSA club. And Rita just goes and looks for this signal. That's what she scans for. She's not trying to scan for different signals and stuff she's just looking for this one because she's made money with it she believes in it she's become confident with it and she absolutely loves trading it and because she's been making money with it she literally doesn't look for anything else that's what she looks for the uptrust and what i find quite fascinating about rita's uh, setup is she looks for these at market tops or resistance lines and when she sees them she just shorts them. Now, if you see an up thrust and the market is on going up on extremely high volume, then you've got a very good opportunity of making money. So the up thrusts. Up thrusts are there for a very good reason, and that is to trigger stops in weak market. However, many chart patterns look like up thrusts but fail to live up to their promises. The up thrust has to look right. It has to be in the right place. Many are created in a strong market by gapping up at the opening, then falling off for a rest only to carry on up afterwards. The genuine ones are easy to see. Basically, you should have a sign of weakness in the background. Now, when I first was learning VSA, this statement confused me. Because I said, Tom, surely an up thrust is an up thrust. It's just a bar on high volume with a wide spread closing on the low. Surely I should just short it. But then Tom explained to me that up thrusts work best when there's been a lot of selling in the background or there's been resistance in the background. Now, we don't really have any up thrusts on this chart, but I'm just looking at this price bar here which is this one 
next to this one to see if it closes lower than this bar here. But this bar here is not an upthrust. It's a buying climax because the range or the spread of the bar is wide and it closes near the middle. But an upthrust, if that was an upthrust, this price would close near the low of the bar or, or a bit like that bar there. So if that bar there was there and close on the low, you will see lower prices because upthrusts happen at resistance levels and they happen in downtrends. The best place to short the upthrust is in a downtrend. It's a great trade setup. You'll make a lot of money trading the upthrust in a downtrend. Now, if you trade an upthrust at a resistance level, you're trading against the trend of price because the trend will be bullish in the background. But that doesn't mean it won't make money. Upthrusts at resistance can be very powerful. Now, can anyone tell me why professional money upthrust the market at resistance? What are they trying to achieve? Can anyone have a guess at that one? What are they trying to achieve? Well, look, well done, Lance. You've got that one, right? Yeah, Nathan, well done. Joyce, great one. You're exactly right. Terry, yeah, very observant. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I tell you, a lot of you here, and Fiona, you're right. Yeah, Gregory, you're right. Yeah, well done, TP. Yeah, all of you are getting this, actually. That's great stuff. I mean, you're picking this stuff up. They're trying to entice traders to go long through a resistance line. And a lot of uninformed traders buy breakouts, especially when they see the price rushing through it. So they buy a breakout. And computerized systems buy breakouts too. Some of the biggest hedge funds in Chicago went bust in 2009 because their software was buying breakouts when in fact they were false breakouts because the market was being sold. So actually, upthrusts can be very, very powerful to short them because if they're on extremely high volume or ultra high volume and it closes on the lower the bar, then you've got a great trade coming. Now here, we have an upthrust. Okay, there are two types of upthrusts. There is the upthrust and there is the hidden upthrust. I don't want you to get wrapped up between the two. They both have the same power. So don't get wrapped up when you see in the software hidden upthrust versus upthrust. The only difference is a hidden upthrust, the price closes within the body of the bar behind it. And a normal upthrust, the price closes above the high of the previous bar, but will always close in the bottom 10% of the bar. Okay, so keep that in mind. A genuine upthrust, as determined by Trade Guider and VSA, will close in the bottom 10% of the bar. We've never told you that publicly before because we don't want anyone copying our software, but it is one of the rules. It closes in the bottom 10% of the bar. And when you see an upthrust, it give it a lot more power when it's in a downtrend or when it's at a resistance line. And we've shown you today how to identify resistance lines. It's not difficult. Put up 500 bars and look in the background. Now, upthrusts work even better after a serious sign of weakness has appeared, like a buying climax. Now, I haven't had an upthrust, I'm afraid, yet, but we might get one. Now, what's happening to this market is what I expect to happen. Prices have fallen because ultra-high volume on an up bar with the next bar down has confirmed my analysis. And this is live. This isn't a PowerPoint slide we're using. You know, that's the wonderful thing about this system that I teach and Tom teaches is we're proud to show these indications and explain them live because they work. Now, Tom has actually said to me earlier on, I should have been short right there. <laughs> He's right. But I'm actually waiting for no demand and we might see it in the next 10 minutes. But when we see upthrusts, remember and write that down, the price should close in the lower 10% of the bar. 
the volume should be ultra high, but you can have very low volume up thrust as well. But if I see an ultra high volume up thrust, especially at resistance, I'm probably going to take the short without even thinking about it. I'm probably just going to short it. Because I know that's a deliberate maneuver by the smart money to catch stops, trap traders that are using technical tools. Remember, most of the people out there that are trading these markets, especially the public, don't use volume. They don't understand it like you do. So they're using some sort of technical analysis tool. So they are looking at past price, and their computer software is predicting the future price. Well, guess what happens? With an upthrust, there will be an uptrend behind them, and their MACD, their stochastic, and their moving average are all telling them to go long. Suddenly, a surge in volume happens, and the price rises, and they wrongly think, and it is wrong, that professionals or, or the smart money or anything, everyone must be buying into this breakout. But that's exactly what the smart money want you to do. They want you to buy into the breakout so that they can trap you, so that they can take your hard-earned money and, uh, and do it. Now, it's interesting. I've been taken into a position here on the, uh, on the Aussie dollar because I had an order in there on the smaller time frame. Now, what's interesting... I'll just show you this. This is how we look at the market in a different time frame. On a three-minute chart, okay, now this is very an interesting thing to show you. You'll notice that this bar here, okay, is showing a different signal to the other bar, which is the buying climax. Now, that is an upthrust, and it's a genuine one. Here it is. And that is what it looks like live. Okay, now that's a three-minute chart, and I just saw it on my other screen. And now we've got um, a very clear setup here, as we can see, because what's happening there is the market is falling, and it's falling for a very good reason, by the way. It's falling because of the buying climax uh, and the uh, and the upthrust bar. Let me just quickly see if I can show you this. Okay, and just get rid of that. And I'm going to show you the one-minute chart of this, just so you can see. Can you all see my trading dome, by the way? Can everyone see my screen? I, just want to see, I don't know if you can see this, so I'm in a position here. Um, can everyone see this? Just so you know, this is my account. So I've got short, and I'll show you why as well in a second. Okay, and my stop's quite a way above me here, and I've got a target just below me. Okay, good. All right, and let's put the uh, the chart up now and show you the one-minute chart, because I don't use one-minute charts to trade, but this one was quite fascinating. And actually, Tom was, was the one pointing at it, <laughs> and he's quite right. Um, I've got to show this, because it does actually confirm pretty much what we're teaching you today is actually, you know, really good information. Because if we look here at this one minute chart and some of you trade forex so this would apply on forex as well yeah so here is like exactly the same thing that we saw on the three minute chart but this time it's on a one minute chart now interestingly we've got a little bit of support coming in down here at this level but if this market goes up and this is what I call a gotcha bar, okay? Now, it's a gotcha bar for a reason, because it's taken out this prior support. Now, the software is going to see that as a sign of strength. But I can read the market clearer, because I can see that this line of support just got taken down with a widespread down. So I'm not going to look at a green indicator and say, oh, I should be long there. I'm going to say that just took out all the prior support to the left, okay, which is good for what I'm trying to achieve. Because if I put a red line across here, you will see that it's taken out this support line. In fact, that's not the greatest line in the world, but you, you get my point. So here, we've got a green signal. We don't suddenly say green buy. There is an attempt to support the market, but this bar here is closed on the low. And look at the next two bars. They've closed level with it. Now that tells me something. In the last three minutes, 
something happened on that bar to take out the support line. Now, if it goes back up there on no demand, even more, we get confirmation of what the market's doing. So the up thrust we see there in three different time frames, we get three different messages that all confirm the same thing. On the 15 minute chart, the five minute chart, we see a buy and climax. On the one minute and the three minute chart, we've got an up thrust. So what does that tell me? On every time frame, I've got weakness. And on every time frame, the market has fallen quite dramatically. I've got in a little late, but I'm okay with that because I can carry this trade for a couple of days if I need to. But I know that the up thrust is a weak bar. And when you see them, you will expect the market to behave in a weak manner, especially when you've got in the background uh, the weakness that we saw. There's another example. This is in gold. And again, we note the high volume on that bar that I'm pointing at. It's absolutely massive. I love ultra high volume up thrust bars, especially when you've got a gotcha bar right behind you. Now, again, if you don't know what a gotcha bar is, it's in my book. I hope you've all read the book, but please, you know, I know if you're not, uh, I'm not a great reader of books myself. I find it quite difficult sometimes to sit and I don't get time basically to, to read, but I have to make time to do it because I want to make money in the market. And I've read a lot of books on the market. I've read a lot of books about, um, uh, you know, the universe that we live in. And one of the things that I really, really know about the market when it's being sold off is it all starts with that ultra high volume. And that is the key to it. It all starts with ultra high volume. And when it starts, all it tells me is that activity is there. Now here on this chart, we've got a widespread down, massive volume. There's your gotcha bar. The market goes back up. It always seems to do this. It seems to retrace just to catch people out. But look at that. That is an up thrust. Okay, that is a place you take a short. That definitely is. Okay, so someone else is taking the mic. Good, Gling. Let me just bring you in. And your mic's open, Gling. And welcome to the seminar. How are you today? Great. Hi. Yeah, I, I have a question on the trade that you took. It's yep. more about like how, like you mentioned that you might have that particular trade for a couple of days. So mm -hmm. my question is, how do you like what time frame do you manage your trades on or like what how do you determine what time frame you're going to manage your, your trade on yep great question okay so i'll leave your mic open okay let me just ask you a few questions then gling uh, observing this chart okay, okay observe this mm -hmm. chart are we in an uptrend or a downtrend uh down sideways right now correct down and sideways do you agree that there is a resistance line where my red line is. Do you agree that there's definitely resistance to higher prices at that red line? Yes, definitely. Okay. It's, it's shown itself. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you spot a Yao Ming bar in the last five or six bars? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You definitely do. There it is. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. so th there is your supply coming in in a downtrend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yep. so mm -hmm. everything, if I'm ticking my boxes in my trading plan, on the hourly chart, I'm in harmony with the river. The river's flowing downwards, and I'm jumping in and flowing mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. On the small yep. on yep. the smaller time frame, I'm seeing clear indications of weakness on a 15 minute, a five minute, a three minute, and a one minute. Okay, so I'm seeing mm -hmm. that, and okay. I've, got, I've got a realistic area to come down to in a downtrend. I've got an area about 250 here. It's about 30 ticks away. Mm -hmm. Now. When I get okay. there, which I haven't got there yet, but when I get there, mm -hmm. which I will, I will look at the volume. Now, if the volume is increasing on the downside, closing on the low, it takes out that support line. I'm staying in this mm -hmm. trade. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to come out of that trade because mm -hmm. the reason that I'm not going to is I've got to look at the biggest picture possible, which I use the four hour and the hourly chart. And what do I see? On the four hour chart well I see a lot of things I see a lot of weakness on that bar there see that one okay that's uh -huh. what's, that's what's causing the market to go down now if I mm -hmm. put a line on the low of that bar which is where my stop is on the four hour chart all of a sudden mm -hmm. the charts talking to me it's a language it's telling me that distribution took place up here and that every time mm -hmm. price tried to go back to that line it was rejected 
So it tells mm -hmm. me that actually, realistically, my trade in the next week or two days could go down to my 50% mm -hmm. Fibonacci retracement line, which is right down there. And if we look at the mm -hmm. number, I think it wants to come down to 1.000. So if I'm correct, my risk on this trade is $380, and my reward is just nearly $7,000. And I've taken mm -hmm. this trade. I've taken this trade several times in the last few months, so I know these things work. So when you see th this type of activity going on, is it possible for me to get up thrusted and stopped out the trade? Yes, it is. And I know what my risk is. My risk is only a five thousand dollar account, but if my reward is correct, I'm going to double my account size mm -hmm. in three or four days. And Gary Dayton, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gary Dayton took the same type of trade actually he took a trade to the to the long side when we were in australia but he was using what we call a spring trade which he'll explain uh, on wednesday so what i'm looking at i'm looking at the evidence you know i'm a former policeman as you probably mm -hmm. know so i'm looking at the evidence in the chart and the chart is giving me some evidence now if i look again at the um the trend of price from up here we are making lower highs on the bar. You agree with that? Yep. Yeah. So we're making lower highs. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've got an attempt to support the market here. But that bar mm -hmm. there, even though they attempted to support the market, the next bar closed it's lower. Failed. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it was not good. There's a test. But as the market's mm -hmm. going up, if this bar in the next uh, 10 minutes closes on the low mm -hmm. or near the low on that sort of volume, mm -hmm. then I'd expect lower prices. But my key is mm -hmm. wanna, I've got to take out the low of that bar there. That's the one I'm going to watch at 1.0255. When I, if we get there, when there's no, remember, when you're trading, there's no guarantee the market will do what you expect mm -hmm. it to do, but I'm just using yep. the probabilities. Simple as that. Make sense? So, so just to sum up this, when you're looking at how to manage your trades, you're also looking at a lot of time frames. I'm looking at not, not just here. the time frame that you got into. Yep, here it is, four hour, I mean, these are the time, I don't use the 30 so much, the main ones that I use is the 5, mm -hmm. the 15, the hour, and the 4 hour, and if you've read my book, you'll, 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 it's in there, and when we, when we talk about the trading plan on Thursday, you'll see the time frames that I use, but those ones, I don't need to use too many, I mean, some traders use mm -hmm. far too many, and they get, oh, they get confused, but what we know mm -hmm. is that on the bigger time frame, the first thing I'm looking for is the definition of trend. Is the trend up or down on the bigger time frame and the other ones going forward? When all the trends align is your greatest probability of making money. So mm -hmm. when you see the 5, the 15, the hourly and the 4 hourly all red, they're not there at the moment, they're in congestion a bit. But when they're all red and you want to go short, then you, I literally take any principle on the 15-minute chart of weakness and short it. I don't really get too concerned what it is. If it's no demand, mm -hmm. if it's an upthrust, these are the things I'm looking for because I already know mm -hmm. that price is moving down on each time frame that I'm using. And the four yeah. hour in currencies, mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you trade, Bling? What, what's your, uh, what markets do you trade? 6A and ES. Yeah, okay. So you trade pretty similar yeah. to what I trade, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and when those prices are moving, especially with the, uh, the currencies, once the, the reason I, I like to stay in a currency mm -hmm. trade is if it moves in my favor, and that's the if. If it moves mm -hmm. in my favor and I can get that stop to break even, you can leave that trade sometimes for two or three days, and the price trends, mm -hmm. re well, you know that, it trends really well. Yep. Uh, that's yep. why, that's mm -hmm. why I trade the currency. Yeah. But no, those, those are the time frames, thing. Look at the four yeah. hour, okay. the hourly, uh -huh. the 15 and the five. All right? Okay, okay got it. Mm -hmm. Great, great, Thank you. great question, mm -hmm. Sting. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, good. I, I encourage you guys to, to, to bring a microphone tomorrow. And ask questions. That's how we all learn, you know. We've overrun. I apologize for that. But, you know, the idea is that we're going to not just show you PowerPoint slides. We're going to show you what the market's actually doing with the principle so that you can see. Uh, now, it's on a four-hour chart, uh, TP. It's on a four-hour chart. Uh, Nathan says, will you then enter on the intermediate tick below or wait for the close of the four-hour bar? Now, I'm now going to watch this over the next um, sort of eight hours. Um, and see what the market does on this four-hour chart. See, what, what do you all notice about this four-hour bar? There's a lot of volume on that bar. The market's likely to retrace. So it's likely, it's not definite. So if we actually put up a chart here, and we take our old resistance level to the left, right, which makes total sense, 
And if you want to put on a Fibonacci retracement, which I, I do like to use, you can see I've got an initial one, which is on a much longer term time frame. But if I just put a short term, and there's the 50. So if we just say, let's modify the Fib. So take the top, which is there. Take the low, which is there. Okay, so is this market going to retrace to 1.0228? That's 50 ticks of price. And if it does, what's it going to do when it gets there? That's all the questions I ask myself as a trader. And if it does retrace down to that level, as soon as it gets there, if it breaches that level on very high volume, and by the way, I haven't seen any opposing force to stop that happening yet, then this trade's going to run. So it's all about patience. Okay, all right. So it's uh, yeah, we have overrun. I apologise. Someone just said you've got a, you've got another appointment. Okay, well we will overrun on these because Tom and I want to teach you stuff. So we've run four hours today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you've uh, you know you've learned something. At the end of the day, Tom and I love doing this. We love teaching uh, VSA, as I'm sure you can uh, imagine. And uh, Tom has uh, just gone off for a quick sleep now because he's uh, he's. He gets very tired. He has to uh, sort of get a, a nice nap during the day. So he's gone off for his nap. But hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back with you tomorrow, same time. You'll get an email with the link for tomorrow's uh, event. And remember, if you've got questions tomorrow, or you, you think of something overnight, write your questions down and uh, bring them with you tomorrow. If you've got a microphone, come and talk to us. Don't be shy. Um, you know, we want you to contribute. And I think Lance today in Bling, contributed that's great hey the best way to learn is to ask the question and uh you know for us for tom and i no question is a silly question okay and yeah if you want to email us some charts by all means uh gavin h at tradeguider.com and if you feel more comfortable doing that um we can open those charts and have a look at them uh on thursday or friday in fact i encourage that if you want us to look at some charts please please do so tom obviously loves looking at charts and uh, although his eyesight's going I'm able to explain to him what's happening on the charts and uh, he's then able to uh, follow them through so we'll see you tomorrow morning 6 a.m. Chicago time which is midday here in England thanks to all of you and thanks for your support of Trade Guider and I hope you enjoyed today I certainly did I know Tom did and we'll see you all in the morning so have a great day good trading and wish you uh, constant profits in the market take care everyone bye bye